Court, we're here for day three of the trial in the matter of CFI 12, 2014, Pierre Eric Daniel Bernard Leeds versus El Seco Limited before His Excellency Justice Anian Madani. The claimant is represented by Al Tamimi and Co. Lead counsel is Zishan Dar, assisted by Tariq Shreik and Mohammed Mahmoud. The defendant is represented by Clyde and Co. Lead counsel is Edward Kemp, assisted by Rebecca Ford. Yeah, good morning, everyone. Good morning, my lord. Yeah, I confirm receiving the joint statement of the experts. There is anything you want to hand to me as well, or we can move on to the Lord, witnesses? The stage. Um, if I can call my second witness, Mr. Chong. Yes. Okay. Sorry, Kabiru. Kabiru? Yes, slip of the tongue, my lord. Is that by mistake, or you want to change the order of witnesses? No, um, by mistake, my lord. Um, first thing in the morning, uh, it sometimes takes a while. Please state your name and your residential address to the court. I'm Roland Paipuno, living in the Mahul building, Goodbye. I swear by my almighty God that the evidence that I am about to give is the truth, the whole truth, and nothing but the truth. Need to introduce your witness, Mr. Kaipuna. Could you um, take out bundle B, please, of the files? Can you turn to tab five, please. Is this your witness statement? Yes, this is. And if you turn to page two eight three of that statement, is that your signature? Yes, this is missing nature. Have you had an opportunity to read through this statement? Pardon? Have you had an opportunity to read through this witness statement? Yeah, I had the opportunity. Are you satisfied that the contents of this statement are true and accurate to the best yeah, of knowledge? Yes, I am. Um, my Lord, I just have two supplemental questions to ask this witness. They have risen from cross-examination. Um, Mr. Kaipuno, what do you understand the term deferred revenue to mean? In accounting terms, when you say deferred revenue, this is the cash that received already, but the revenue is yet to be recognized in the future. Um, can you take out C6, please? Turn to page 2181. C6, which tab? Um, tab uh, 113. Can you repeat tab? 113. 113. Bundle C6 tab 113, there's a 113 here. Um, ah, sorry, there's Yes. This is an email from Mr. Lease, dated the 29th of January, and yes. we can see that you're copied into that email. Yes. And you can see the subject, forward deferred revenues issue. Yes, I saw it. What did you understand Mr. Lease to mean by that term? With the term used by Mr. Lees, because I'm an accountant and I could understand, in his uh, opinion, I, my understanding is he is. How can this witness know what Mr. Lees believed it to mean or understood it to mean? It was sent to him. Yes, but how can he believe? How can he know what Mr. Lees intended to mean? I'm not asking him that question. I'm asking him what, what you he understand from this letter. What he understood yeah. the term to mean. Because letter. based on the way the. Uh, 5.2 million calculated. He started with the figure 5.5 million 574.078.18 as marked as total revenues 2014 and beyond. So, meaning he's actually referring to the revenue that will be that will be recognized in the future. In the future, you mean the next year? Yes, because it was marked with total revenues 2014 and beyond. 
and this is actually an accrued revenue. And what did you understand by the total unrecorded revenues of 5.2 um, million? What did you understand by that? Again, when we look at the way it was calculated, from the 5,574,078.18, 5, he deducted the amount that was already recognized in the draft, draft trial balance, which is outstanding payments, the L plus 3 and L plus 5 Amazonas 2 and Tycoon 6, and then he come up with this 5.2 million. And uh, for me, it is trying to, to say that this amount is not yet recognized, that could be potentially recognized in 2013. Could be. Yes. Could be not. Yes. Could be and could be not. Yes. Yes. And there may not be some further questions for you. Thank you. Uh, uh, thank you. Do, do you want to start from where Mr. Kemp has finished? I, 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 I'm, many, many, I'm grateful, Your Worship. Uh, Mr. Kemp, you um, gave us uh, a, a nice definition of deferred revenues, which no doubt you know very well, yes. having been an accountant since 2004. Yes. And I think you worked for Grant Thornton from about 2005, is that right? Uh, la, uh, or thereabouts. Yeah. So as of the date uh, of the audit, uh, you had been um, an accountant for about seven years. Yes. And given your familiarity with the term deferred revenue and what you understand it to mean. When you saw the email of the 28th of February to begin with, that's the one which refers to 4 million deferred revenue. Do you want to take to that? Where is that email? January. Sorry, January. January. Okay. Uh, that's the email. Well, let's, actually, let's go in reverse. Yes, I saw the email, but I have, you have to understand so that the email was addressed. Wait for the question. Yeah. Turn to page, uh, tab 113. You knew exactly what deferred revenues meant, you say, on the 29th of January. Yes. Uh, and... Given that you say what Mr. Lease was trying to do was take into account revenues that had not, well, he was trying to suggest that these revenues had already been received, correct? No, and I didn't say that. And therefore should be included. No, I didn't say that. Well, let, let's do this again. Your understanding of deferred revenues is contrary to what you say Mr. Lease was suggesting deferred revenues meant in this email, correct? Yes. Right. At that stage, why didn't you say to Mr. Lease, hang on a minute, this is completely wrong? My Lord, let me explain my side. The first email sent by Mr. Lease was addressed directly to the PWC dated January 28th. Now, if you thread on the email, if you see the thread on the email. Can the, can the witness oh, you yeah, because you see it in this email. You were yeah, when, when Mr. Lee sent the first email, I was not copied on well, it. We know that. Yeah. But this email here, that you've got in front of you at tab 113. Again, my lord, let me explain my side. On the okay, 29th of January, yes, I admit I was copied on the email. But again, it was directly addressed to the PWC. And that time, you have to understand that I have also many things to do. I have uh, priorities to do aside from the audit. We are also working on the migration of the uh, from single accounting to double entry accounting. And that time, also dealing with some queries from the members. So I have to set uh, things to be done uh, properly. So meantime, I set aside this email. But I, when I said I set aside, it doesn't mean that I have to ignore this. I have to attend on some other times. So okay, ha have you done that? 
Have you replied to this email by any means to any person? Have you talked about it to BWC, to your management, to the claimant, to anyone? Actually, time because I am. Have you expressed your thoughts about yeah. what you believe in this email? Honestly, I did not. Yes. Which would effectively add about 60% to the total revenue. Yes. And you say your reason for doing nothing about it is because you're too busy. Yes. And one thing more, since it was it was during the audit and addressed to the PwC, and I, 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 let, I left the case with the PwC who will go into resolve the issue because I know the process of the audit. If the auditor would have an issue on this one, they have to come to me or either to the management to discuss the issue. So I think I don't see any issue on this one. Yeah. So, so the real reason you. you did nothing was you knew that there was a safety barrier in place. Yeah. It was going to be a check done by PwC. Yes. Okay. Let, it, let me ask this question. Sir. So you was thinking this would never go through, that's what you thinking. This no. proposal would never go through, it would be stopped somewhere. Yes. Uh, you became a CFO after Mr. Lee left, is that right? I became the CFO on the 17th of April 2014. On the very day that he received his letter of dismissal with reasons? Yeah. Uh, and that would have been two months after, around two months after he left on the 11th of February, yep? Yes. Um, can I suggest to you, uh, one is, it's okay to infer from that, but that by around the 11th of February, you were sufficiently competent to act in the role of the CFO. But you were sufficiently competent. You could do the job. Can I rephrase your question? Yeah. You were able to do Mr. Lee's job around the 11th of February, weren't you? you yes. Were to do it. Yes, but we had the process before I began the CFO. Okay. So, because of your experience uh, and your knowledge of the business of El Seco, you agree that as of early 2014, you were sufficiently competent to do Mr. Lisa's role? Yeah, in my opinion, yes. You say in your statement that one of the reasons you didn't query the question of tax is because Mr. Lisa was your line manager or your boss, effectively. That's the reason you give. Recall that in your statement? Can you rephrase that? Yeah. You say in your statement that one of the reasons you didn't want to challenge Mr. Lease on tax or PT is because he was your manager or your boss. That's not what I meant. That's what you say. We actually raised the issue regarding the IPT. Yes, I know you did, but you said one of the reasons you accepted his instructions is because he was your boss. Yeah, and yes. But I'm going to suggest to you, Mr. Capuno, that because of your experience and your knowledge of the business and your seniority in the business, you were perfectly capable of challenging Mr. Lee on any issue related to the audit. Yes. Uh, and the reason you didn't challenge him on this particular issue is because you recognized it was a matter for further discussion and nothing else. My Lord, may I explain my side with yes. regards to this issue IPT? I'm not asking you about IPT at this stage. I'm suggesting to you that the reason you didn't challenge Mr. Lees about this email on the 29th of January is because you realized that it was a topic for further discussion. 
Nothing more. Nothing less. Roy? Yes. Um, regarding the issue of um, IPT, it's right, isn't it, that you conducted a meeting on the 19th of January, uh, conducted a presentation on the 19th of January in front of Mr. Le Maire and other members of the council. Yes. And in that presentation, you uh, were saying that there's no possible basis to recognise uh, insurance tax as a revenue. Uh, my Lord, let me explain my side what was actually happened during the 19th of January. Well, we set the meeting. Just, just I just want to know whether you're present in your presentation. I'm not criticising. I'm just asking you whether it's right that in your presentation you were saying that IPT should not be recognised as revenue. Yes. Thank you. And at the time, you believed that Mr. Lease wanted to have IPT recognised as revenue. Before that, it was already recognised. It was already recognised. Yes. You were saying it's wrong. Yes. Okay. You didn't know that Mr. Lease was going to leave No, I'm not aware. But you were prepared to go into that meeting and express your views formally in a presentation, notwithstanding Mr. Nisa's presence. Regarding the presentation that we have prepared, the main issue is not the IPT to be exact. But that was one of the issues, wasn't it? It just, it just came across that while we are discussing this uh, new accounting software, it just so happened that one of the topics that have been brought out is the IPT. My point is that you weren't reluctant or reserved to express your views about the accounting treatment of various items, were you? No, it just came across during the meeting. Um, can I just take you please to uh, tab 69 of bundle 6, please? Bundle C6. Please. Are you there? Yes. Now, this is an email that was sent to Eureka, who is a member of the accounts team. And uh, Mr. the Mayor, Mr. Lees, and yourself to copy into this. You must reply because the mic won't pick you up if you just nod your head. Is that yes? Pardon? You agree with what I've said so far? Yes. Okay. Um, and this was a draft proposal to be sent out to members, i.e. entities that are being insured. Uh, my lord, let me just refresh my memory on this email. Yes, certainly, please do. Yes. The reason this was sent out was because there was some uncertainty about uh, how um, members should treat insurance premium tax. Yes. Now, you 
said historically that insurance tax had been treated as a revenue. Yes, and I could specify which date you recognize that. It's right, isn't it, that those, and that's before your time, isn't it? Yes. So you are able to comment on whether or not uh, the recognition of taxes as revenue was following uh, consideration by auditors. Can you rephrase the question? You can't say whether or not the auditors had considered the tax position in previous year's accounts, can you? Looking at the prior year's accounts before I joined ELSCO, I saw in the balance sheet that there is an IPT payable, so meaning the IPT at that time was recognized as payable. Well, you don't know what discussions took place between Mr. Leith and auditors prior to your arrival. Yes. You, you do know what discussions no, I, I, I don't know the discussion that took place. Right. Uh, and can I just take you to tab 84, uh, 84 please, same bundle. This is an email from Mr. Lease to Mr. Le Maire, <coughs> subject IPT and other taxes. Have you seen this email? No, because I was not copied on the email. Sorry? No, because I was not copied on the email. Oh, well, please, please read it. Laurent, based on the investigation... Yeah, to yourself. We well, are not expecting him to read the whole email. Would you please refer him to the paragraph he wants? Uh, certainly, you would. Uh, if you could just read the... Uh, the second paragraph, please. I'm done. You've read the second statement, and you're not in a position to dispute the contents of that second paragraph, are you? Pardon? You're not in a position to dispute the contents of that second paragraph, are you? Yes. You are in a position? No, I, yeah, I'm, I'm not in the position to dispute, yes. Thank you. Uh, would you kindly turn now, please, to uh, tab 69? Is it on the same bundle, 69? Yes, C69. It's an email dated the 19th of January. Oh, sorry, forgive me. Uh, it's in fact C68. there, wouldn't you agree, on the 19th of January, is uh, providing audit working schedules for 2013? Yes. And that goes to Mr. Lees and Mr. Toulon. Ms. Toulon. Yes. Right. Now, uh, 
Now turn to tab 74 of the bundle. And you'll see there an email from Mr. Lemaire to Mr. Lees. I'm assuming you haven't seen this email before. Yes, I haven't seen this before. And you'll see right in the first uh, paragraph, point one, Mr. Lemaire queries the rationale behind the recognition of taxes as revenues. You see that? Yes. And that was um, following his receipt of your presentation, wasn't it? Yes. So there was no, uh, as it were, ambiguity about or uncertainty about whether IPT was an issue in this audit. Can you repeat the question? There was no uncertainty that IPT was a live issue in this audit. It's a live issue, isn't it? Yes. And that's even before the audit had started on the 26th of January. Yes. You'll see here that Mr. Lees immediately uh, picks up following your meeting on the 20th of January uh, on various questions relating to premium uh, as commissions, end of service gratuity, and expenses. Mm -hmm. Yes. Was this normal for Mr. Lemaire to pick up on these things? Yes. So, am I right in saying that he did participate in the audit process, Mr. Lemaire? The audit is not yet started at the time, so we are, we, we are still on the preparation of the draft trial balance. So he was participating in the preparation of the trial, trial, draft balance too? Yes, but at this time, he, I never sent the draft trial balance to Mr. Lemaire. So even before you sent the draft balance, Mr. Lemaire is asking questions about various accounting items? Yes. Uh, and that email was sent the very next morning after your presentation, or the finance meeting. Yes. Okay. Can I ask you to turn to tab 77 now? Now, following on from that email, you can see at the top, unfortunately we don't have the, uh, sorry, forgive me, if you just turn over the page to 2094, you can see that Mr. Uh, Lease, uh, sorry, Mr., yeah, if you, if you turn again over to 2095, see that Mr. Lees responds to points four and five of the list of questions that were sent by Mr. Lees uh, and then uh, uh, asks for inputs on items one, two and three. Did you see that? Yes, I saw it. And then if you turn back to 2094, uh, Mr. Lemaire uh, then uh, thanks him for answering points two and three. Uh, I think that may have been answering points four and five is what he meant, but in any event, uh, 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 and he, he notes the response to point three. You see that? Yes, sorry. You, I appreciate you weren't copied into this emails, 
But as far as you're aware, having worked in this business, um, was this normal dialogue between Mr. Leeds and Mr. Lemaire? You have been the management, yes. What is that? First line, point one. It says, please confirm whether the statement is correct or not. Okay, yes. Not, as explained above, we did brought up the topic on IPT recording, so we know what to do going forward. Yes. That's your response as well as Anne Marie Chance. Yes. So you were denying that you had been forced, correct? Can you repeat? You were denying the allegation that Mr. Lees had forced you. No, we are, we are not denying on this. Well, that's what it says. You see, to start from the top again, Rolando, Anna Marie, I have been told by the management that you reported having been forced you to modify the accounts, some items despite your reluctance to do so. If you were not involved in these discussions with management, please disregard this email. If you were involved, point one, please confirm whether this statement is correct or not. And you put not. In other words, you're saying that the statement that you've been forced is not correct. I said that it's just a way that we don't like the term force being used. I would have thought that the words in capital, not, were, wouldn't you agree, a comprehensive and unambiguous response to the question whether you've been forced? No, that's not what I meant. So why do you put it in capitals? We're just trying to say that we are not being forced. That's what we meant on this one. Yes. Okay. And then if you turn to tab 87, please. <coughs> uh, and this is a more detailed response from Anna Marie Chong page 2112, to Mr. Lee's copying in yourself and Laurent Le Maire. And it deals with whether or not you've been forced. What I'd like to do, because we've been through this document already, is to look at the section PS. Can you see that on the second page? Yes. PS, Pierre-Eric, we appreciated so much that you made your comments, stroke questions direct to us. This would help avoid complications, unnecessary stories, and 
further misunderstandings within the office. Thank you. The we again, the plural, is a reference to you too, isn't it? Yes. And do you uh, agree with the statement that follows the uh, acronym PS? Yes. It suggests, doesn't it, that you had a open relationship with Mr. Leeds where you could communicate with him without fear of reprisal. Pardon? One? You had an open relationship with Mr. Leeds. Sorry, I'm going to rephrase that. That sounds wrong. You had a type of relationship with Mr. Leeds where you could say what you believed without fear of reprisal. Yes. Can I take you to paragraph 30 of your witness statement, please? Which is uh, in bundle B uh, at tab 5. You have 10 minutes. Yes, I'll be finished very soon. Yeah, great. Do you have a chance to read paragraph 30? Page 280. Which paragraph? Paragraph 30. This is for 00276. It may be in your bundle. Should be 280. 280. This is one in my bundle. It's page 7 of your statement. It's 30, 30. Okay. Yeah. Paragraph 30. Um, you say, Mr. Lanier, you're talking about the meeting. Of, do you want to read it first? Would you like to read it first? Yes. Yes. Mm -hmm. Mr. Lemire opened the meeting by thanking everyone involved in preparing 2013 accounts and the audit. He then moved on to talk about revenue recognition and the adjustments that have been made, example the recognition of outstanding premium as revenue and an additional US dollar of 5.2 million in revenue. Okay, so in this sentence, uh, you say say the adjustments that had been made? Adjustment to be made. Oh, adjustments to yes. be made. Right. You see, you say adjustments that be made. That should be to be made, yeah. Okay. Well, thank you for clarifying that. Uh, and it's been suggested to Mr. Le Maire yesterday. My, my Lord, let, because in here, these, they are referring to two figures, just to be uh, precise yes. on this one. They mentioned about the recognition of the outstanding premium as revenue and an additional US dollar of 5.2 million revenue. The recognition of outstanding premiums, yeah, this had been uh, recognized. This had been recognized as revenue, but the 5.2 million in revenue is not yet recognized. Has not yet been recognized. Yes, yes. just to be precise. Clear. That's all I wanted to clarify. And it's right, isn't it, that that figure of outstanding premium is expressly referred to uh, in the email of the 2nd of February uh, from Miss Sindhu to the entire El Elsico team, accounts team um, as being, again, an item for further discussion. Do you want to look at that email? Yeah, can I sort of see that? one, two, three. <coughs> Which bundle is that? Uh, C6, bundle 6. Yeah. 
Page number again. It's page number two, uh, 2211. Yes. This is an email you received on the 2nd of February from PwC, and it attaches a document uh, which you'll see at 2213. And <clears throat> we can see the reference to outstanding premiums of 128 uh, is in the, under the heading further discussion. See that? Yeah? Yeah. And let's just read that uh, narrative there. Around 128k income is recognized in non-proportional revenue, while the premiums related to the same have not been received till year end after day cash was performed to determine if any payments were made post year end, but only for one case. $327. The money was received. Need to determine if a provision is needed or is need for these. You'll agree that that's PwC saying they are yet to determine whether or not they ought to include 128000 in the revenues. Yeah, based on their statement, yes. So no final decision uh, had even been, or no, no provisional view had even been put forward by PDC, PwC on that. Yes. Right. Now, can I just ask you uh, to turn to tab, sorry, bundle four, page. Bundles. Bundle four. C4. C4, yes. Which tab is it? Ah, oh, not so sure about that. 47. 47. 47. This is an email sent by you to Mr. Lee. April 2013. Yes. Saying that the amount owing to him in terms of expenses is $34,270. Yes, that is based on my initial review of the expenses. Yeah. You were instructed by Mr. Lemaire later on not to pay that working. Yes, because this the expenses should be uh, again be reviewed. So why say I did not say it's audit. Well, that's what you say. The amount due to you is USD 34,000. Again, that is based on my initial review, and you have to consider that because of the staffing issue, I'm, I'm the only accountant in the office, and I'm, I'm also other tasks to do, and I did not uh, uh, spend most of, my, most of my time doing the review on this one. Perhaps you were influenced later on not to pay that amount. No. Also say, don't you, in the second line, that you'll process the payment once you agree with the figures. Yes. Mr. Leaf did agree with the figures, didn't he? I didn't receive any response from Mr. Leaf. So you're saying. All right. Um, and finally, it's right, isn't it, that at the meeting of the 11th of February, the 11th of February, Mr. Leaf was asking that PwC carry out. Review by reference to the IFRS of revenue. 
Yes. Yeah, if, if you don't move the witness, please. please. My Lord, no, no re-examination if this witness can now be released. Well, thank you very much, Mr. Kabula. Thank you. Thank you. you may call your other witness, Mr. Kent. If I can call my next witness, it's uh, Ms. Lucy Gilchrist. Do you, do you, are you Christian? Or? I, I, oh. I don't practice. Okay, then. Could you take out uh, bundle B, please? May I ask if I just put these all in Course. order? Of course. Yes. tabs uh, in this bundle. Could you turn to tab six, please? Is this your witness statement for these proceedings? Yes, it is, my lord. If you can turn to page 293. Is that your signature? Yes, it is, my lord. Have you had an opportunity to read through this witness statement? Yes, I have. And are you satisfied that the contents of the statement are true and accurate to the best of your knowledge and belief? Yes, I do, my Lord. My Lord, if that stands to what you said, Mr. Chief, there may be some further questions for you. Yeah, Mr. Zichar, with Mrs. Yours. I'm not aware that there was ever a contract of employment. And um, as the HR manager, um, you were tasked, presumably, with ensuring that employee details, including contracts of employment, were kept in place. Yes, I am. And you're aware that uh, under DIFC law, there's a requirement for employers to provide a written My Lord, may I uh, make a statement to the court? That yeah, and then um, answer. Yes, go ahead. Yeah, the law. I'm not fully, I, I, I wouldn't want to say I'm fully aware of that particular law, my Lord. Right. You're not aware of that article. But you've made me, I, I mean, you've made me aware, thank you. Were you responsible for um, putting together the employee handbook? Yes, I was, my Lord. All right. Um, just have a quick look at that. That's in bundle B, I believe. That notes on. C six?
sets out rules and regulations, doesn't it? Correct, yes. It had, has details provision, detailed provisions relating to maternity leave, compassionate leave, unpaid time off. Yes. And, and presumably you would have taken some legal advice before putting this together. I don't know what that is. I did not take legal advice to this together. Right. And so your evidence to the court today is that you're unaware that the claimant is entitled to written terms of his employment. Is that your evidence? No, because actually I, what I said before about um, employees not having a contract, I'm fully aware that employees should have a contract by law, but Mr. Leese was treated differently and he did not have a contract because he was chairman and a very senior member of the company and he was the co-founder and the owner so we never had an employment contract for him but he was an employee wasn't he he was an employee my lord but he wasn't treated like an employee are you, are you saying that there was no contract of employment between mr lease and elsica well, I, that, that's now been determined and um, it's not going to be a matter no, for a witness no, to no, answer a written contract. Yes, it's not a written contract. Yes, but, but you agreed that he was an employee. He was not seen as an employee. In my eyes, and to the company eyes, he was not seen as an employee, my lord. I see. Uh, and you, you say in your witness statement that he's required to notify or comply with the staff handbook when he's absent on leave or Staff handbook is there as a guidance um, and if we have nothing else to refer to as he Guidance for employees or for shareholders? So, sorry, could you repeat the question? You say in your written statement that he needed to comply with the regulations relating to holidays in the staff handbook. The staff handbook. It was expected that you, you... You said you consider him a chairman and a staff. You don't consider him an employee. And then you're expecting him to act as staff by referring to the manual, the handbook. That was because it was raised in respect to expenses he was claiming for a holiday that he had, not, he had said he hadn't taken. So you're cherry picking bits of the staff handbook that apply to him, even though you don't regard him as a member of staff. When, when we say you, that doesn't mean you personally. We say the HR, the company, and everything. Uh, yes, the company. So you're saying bits of the staff handbook apply to him, but not all. Which way is it? This, I would say for Mr. Lees, the, the, as he was a chairman, it wouldn't be so strictly implied as it would be for an employee, but it would still be a, a code of conduct that we would expect him to, to follow. But we just said you, you treat him as a chairman. So if you treat someone as a chairman, and an employee, there, yeah. is, there is clear differences between chairman and employee, so we can see like we can we expecting something different from chairman, this is, and this is true, my different lord. to what we expecting from an employee or a staff. This is correct, my lord. He, he was seen as a chairman, yeah. more than an employee. So he's not a staff. So this is not applicable to him. If he's an employee, that means he's not a staff. That means handbook is not applicable to his situation. No. But, but you were asking him to stick to handbook. 
sometimes. It was only as a, a guidance in reference to when he was saying that he hadn't taken any holiday. Yeah, next this one, next one. Um, I mean, Strait is that he stopped being a chairman on, in January 2013. It was before. It was. You're equal. It's the same thing. It's in the chronology. Is it agreed? It's in the chronology. I'm just asking my learned friend if it's agreed that he stopped being a chairman in January 2013. They stopped being a chairman in January 2013. That so, just so I'm clear, were you treating him as a member of the staff after that or still as a chairman? I, I believe that he should have been treated, once he was no longer the chairman, he should have been treated probably more as an employee, but we still treated him as the chairman. We had a lot of respect for him. So, I, I see what you believe, but have you got any instructions? to change your treat the HR treatment toward him? No, I don't, my lord. No. Okay. Now, you know that Mr. LeMaire's evidence yesterday uh, about holidays and working remotely, he said that it Yes, I do. And he also said uh, that during the time that it's alleged that Mr. Lease uh, was on holiday, he was working perhaps part time. That was his evidence. Yes. You don't disagree with that, do you? Can you repeat the question, please? Do you disagree with the evidence that Mr. Lemaire gave yesterday? He was working, um, he was on holiday, but I agree at times he might well have used his phone or he might have made some emails. Yes. No, no, the evidence that Mr. Lemaire gave yesterday was that during the period of time that it's alleged that the claimant uh, was on holiday, uh, that he was working part time. Yes. He would have done some work on holiday. And that Mr. Le Maire knew about it. That was Mr. Le Maire's evidence. Yes, correct. So it very much makes the whole section of your witness statement relating to taking excessive holidays redundant, doesn't it? In light of Mr. Le Maire's evidence. We knew that Mr. Le, uh, Mr. Lees was taking holiday. He took some holiday. How he, and how you knew? Did he apply for holiday? He was out of the office. Have you time. granted him permission to go on holiday? No, but I was aware through Mr. Le Maire that he was having some time. He was away for three months out of the out of the office, so we knew he was having some holiday. And, and what step have you taken towards that at the time? Have you recorded that holiday? Have you notified him or something? Have you stopped paying him that time? Have you done anything? Have you taken any action in that regard? No. Not at all? No. Yes, and you knew about it? I knew it was on holiday, yes. We, were give, we gave uh, Mr. Lease, a, because of his position in the company, we were more um, accommodating to him to have the time at the office. Okay, let me ask you this. Do you think Mr. Lease was thinking he is in holiday or a working from distance position. I know what you believe about his position from your side. You, would, you, you said mm -hmm. you believe he is in holiday. Oh, even though there is no application, there is no permission for that. But do you know the situation from his side? Have he communicated anything to you about that? He's working in distance, he's not in holiday or anything? Do you know anything about that? Only, that's why I didn't know, could you please give me a repeat? Okay. Do you know that Mr. Lees, the claimant, believed he was not in holiday, he was working from distance? I believe that Mr. 
niece knew that he was having holiday and doing some work. How come? Why, why someone take holiday and keep doing work? Because he's always... Do you pay him for that? He, that he's, that's the practice he's always done since I've joined the company. And he took holiday and keep working? Mm -hmm. Yes, my lord. on to the, the crux of this case, which is the inflation of the accounts. You are aware that an allegation against um, a senior employee in finance with fiduciary obligations of dishonesty and fraud is as serious as it gets. Mm -hmm. Do you agree? Yes, very. And the letter that was sent out under DIFC law Article 60, yes. sorry, DIFC employment law Article 60, um, says that he was dismissed for fraud and dishonesty and I think unethical conduct. Yes, my lord. Uh, and you would agree from your experience in HR that uh, a letter like that can potentially have career-ruining consequences for the employee. A fair comment. It's like a doctor being dismissed from malpractice. An accountant being dismissed for fiddling the expenses. Same sort of thing, isn't it? I did not see it like that. You didn't see it like that. I, di I, didn't, I didn't see it as... A I didn't think it was going to affect his career in the future, my lord. I mean, the allegation is effectively a criminal offence, isn't it? Fraud? Yes, it's a very serious, very serious offence. Okay, would you employ anyone to come to your company with that kind of letter or treatment or dismissal? Would you? No, I wouldn't. Thank you. I'm just taking that one step further. If you were interviewing an employee and you contacted his former employer for a reference and they told you he was dismissed for dishonesty, fraud and unethical behaviour, what impact would that have on your decision making process to employ him? I would, I would need to find out more information, so yes, it would make me think. I would have thought it was a complete deal breaker, don't you think? I, I would like to look into the situation a bit more. I mean, yes, it's, it's, you'd, I would need to look into it for sure. Well, you're a lot more open-minded than most employers, then, Mr. Skilkis. Um, with that in mind, did you not think it would be appropriate, at the very least, just to call Mr. Lee in for an interview on his own? I felt the situation was actually above my level of authority. The, the situation that had happened um, was, was very, very se senior and serious, and it was being dealt with by our company chairman, CEO, and our legal counsel. Did you provide any HR advice before the step was taken to dismiss him? Very little, I'll be honest with that. Um, the only side that I could really see, because on the financial side I, I was not involved, but the side that I could see was, was the more personality traits that were coming out when this all happened, the, when he left the office and the, the way that uh, his conduct was. That was the only thing I could actually really comment on. I see, but nonetheless, um, there was a meeting that occurred before he left the office, wasn't there? Yes? Yes, there was. But you weren't at that meeting, were you? No, I was sitting in the office outside. The so meeting. you don't know what happened? No, I don't. And clearly, the meeting and his leaving the office would have been linked, don't you think? Yeah, yes. Did you not want to, at the very least, find out what on earth he had been accused of following his departure, before he was dismissed? As an HR manager? I'd like to say that I felt it was above my position in this instance because it was moving very, very quickly and it was very heated and I, I felt I couldn't interject. Why didn't you slow it down, put the brakes on? It's a 
mouse to rear at stake. All you have to do, can I suggest to you, Miss Gilchrist, is to speak to Mr. the Mayor and say, before you dismiss, can we just check to see whether or not Mr. Lease has an explanation for these emails? I, at that stage, do not know how serious or what the particular um, accusation was, but I did trust my chairman and CEO that he had been in a situation where he felt he could um, uh, uh, where he where he could dismiss someone immediately. Are you scared of asking, Mr. Le Maire? In this situation, I I I felt it was not my place to get involved. Yes, he would. So, whose place would it be to provide that HR function other than you? Or maybe we just didn't have. I. I can't I'll move on. Ms. Gilchrist. The claimant sent you a series of emails um, on the 11th of February and thereafter, when he hadn't yet recognised his dismissal, saying I'm on holiday. Yes. He was replying saying that he was on taking some holiday. Yes, which. This is the first time I ever hear, see him write asking or saying that he was going to take some holiday. So That's for all of a sudden... A question. He was representing to you that he felt he was still employed, correct? Correct. Given that that was the case, the next day and the next day, up until the 13th of February, did you think perhaps at that stage you ought to just call him in and find out what happened? At this stage, I felt I was out of the process. I find no further questions. Thank you very much. Thank you very much. You may leave the book, sir. Thank you very much. Um, my lord, there's no re-examination of this witness. My Lord, yes, um, Mr. Tolon. You want to take him after Mr. Tolon, is that right? Yes, yeah. My name is Leticia Marie Benjamin Tolon, and I live in Villa 23, Street 24A, Al Jafiria, Dubai. I swear by Almighty God to tell the truth and nothing but the truth. Okay. And yes, Mr. Kim. Could you take up bundle B, please? witness statement in these proceedings. It is. And if you turn to the very last page of that tab. Yes. Right at the end. Is that your signature? It is my signature. Have you had an opportunity to read through this witness statement? I, ha I have. Are you satisfied that this witness statement is true and accurate to the best of your knowledge and belief? Yes. There was one typo I think we mentioned in the second uh, witness statement. Well, if we, um, but, well, but this uh, is the first witness yeah, statement. Okay. Are you satisfied that yes, this I witness am. statement is true and accurate? Yeah. You now turn to pay at tab seven. And is this your second witness statement in these proceedings? It is. 
And if you turn to the last page, which is 298, yeah. is that your signature? Yes, it is. And the typo that you've noticed is that, is it paragraph 8? Uh, paragraph 8. Uh, 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 yes, uh, you prefer to no, uh, um, It's paragraph 4. Yes. It refers to paragraph 18 of my original statement. Sorry, paragraph 4. Yes. Of your second statement. Yes. Yes. Which correction would you like to make? Uh, it, no, it's just that it corrects uh, the, uh, the number that well, I, I stated in my first professed statement. Oh, okay, it's, it's very well, a, yes. Yeah. And have you had an opportunity to read this second witness statement? Sorry. Yeah, I have. Yeah. And are you satisfied that this witness statement is true in that yes. case? Yes. Um, my Lord, there may be some questions for this witness. Thank you very much. This is Sean. wife, as you said, uh, pretty much in the How trial. Long have you been uh, we've been married, um, I would say, 14 years. Do you have children? We do. How many? Uh, two and one coming. One coming? Yes. I think that my relationship with uh, Mr. Le Maire has nothing to do with my work. And actually, we make it pretty clear at the office that I am not his wife. I'm just an employee, and he's my CEO. And that has been made clear every day of my work. You, you ask me to tell the truth, I will tell you the truth. Well, should we need to give a statement and that's it. I'm not, I don't know what you're talking about. You're, you're going to keep the story consistent with what your husband has already said. I don't think you should say that. I mean, I, I'm, I'm just saying the truth about well, the witness the is right. You said go directly to your question. Well, the only reason I'm asking that question is because I don't want to rehearse everything I've asked your husband to save you time and to save this court the inconvenience. I, I, I just ask me a question. I, I, I'm just here Mr. to Zisha, help the court. Ask the question. Go Sorry. direct to the point. Because by the time we write the witness statement, the 5.2 was very much the, the number we were talking because it was the last one. However, on the 28th, Mrs. Sindhu talked about 4 million, not 5.2. And I corrected my, my mistake in the I'm statement. I'm just, I'm just that's telling a, you. That's what I think so. What I want to deal with is this. Um, when you gave your witness statement, who did you give it to? To my lawyers. And they were sitting down taking the statement. No, I wrote, I wrote down my statement oh, you myself. Wrote it down in private? Yes, of course. On a Word document? On a Word document. In the privacy of your own home? No, I, I don't know. I think I've, I've done that at work because it's a work related thing. But when you were alone? Yes? Yes, I was alone, yes. Uh, and when you wrote that statement, you were recalling conversations that you had in your yes. mind's eye picture. Yes, I was, I was just recording and, and recording what I was recalling. And you recorded 5.2 figures, didn't you? This is, this is what I'm explaining to you. Sometimes your, your mind... I have your explanation already. I'm just trying to ask you some questions about how we got to where we are in your second statement. When you um, put down that figure of 5.2 million, was that around the 14th of May of this year? 
No, I wrote before because I wanted everything to be fresh. I just, we just didn't want to let it, let it uh, we knew it would be a long process. So it was better to think about what had happened as freshly as possible, yeah. And at the time uh, that you say, albeit you say it's an error, that Miss Sindhu told you it was 5.2 million, she couldn't possibly have said 5.2 million, could she? No, no, she couldn't have. Because the 5.2 million only comes afterwards yes. in the email of the 29th of February. I agree, that's why I said it was a typo. Uh, and just so I understand this, um, the bundles in this case, all these documents here, were given to your lawyers, I think, uh, about 10 days ago. Um, I, I, I cannot say it was 10 days ago because there were a lot of things, so I guess it was across the whole period of this preparation. I think it was Tuesday the 2nd of June. I don't think that's disputed. Everything? Tuesday on the 2nd of June? No, I, no, I, part of it. My, my Lord, where is my learned friend going with these questions? So shouldn't he just put his cross-examination questions? Well, I, I didn't see any problem so far on that. Just, yeah. Uh, so these bond trial bundles came on the 2nd of June, two weeks after you'd given your initial statement. And your subsequent statement, we could just check that with bundle B, statement two. It's at uh, tab seven. Second witness statement? Yeah, but when was it signed? The first of June. The first of June? Yeah. Okay. And by that stage, um, you had recognized that you had provided information that was incorrect. One piece of information, yes. Yeah. And how did you recognize that? Because I reread my statement. And can I suggest to you that what you did? second time around is that you looked at the actual emails and realized that your original evidence didn't fit the emails. Not at all actually. I read it and I thought, oh gosh, this is not 5.2 because obviously it was after. And I rechecked my notes because I usually take notes and it was for me and that's what I had in mind. So if I made a mistake, I guess I'm sorry, but then I just corrected it because I knew I would have to uh, give my uh, witness statement. So I wanted everything to be correct. An alternative explanation, would you agree? Well, you can't put more than her mouth. She just give you her explanation. Yes, I just have one more question. You agree that an alternative explanation is, having read the documents, you adjusted your evidence to fit those documents. I disagree. You don't think that that is a possibility? She said she disagreed with Mrs. Ishan. Um, because the truth is... Uh, the truth Sindhu for the court, not for the witness. Sorry? Keep the truth for the court, yes, not for I the witness. Yes, I the question, though. I suggest to you that the truth is that you did not have a conversation with Ms. Sindhu on that day. And how can you say that? I, I was with Mr. Sindhu. I actually, to explain to uh, the court, uh, because the, the office was very small, I actually uh, sat in the same room as the auditors. It was uh, Mrs. Freaking Sindhu yes. and then Janet. And then when I came back, because I had this lunch yeah, with everybody, and then I had to pick up my daughter. So I came back, and then uh, Mrs. Sindhu talked to me about the full meeting and how she didn't feel comfortable with this additional revenue that Mr. Liss had put forward to her. And that's all. And, and there was no... There was no other witness but Priti and Anjana, so, but I'm telling the truth. So nobody else witnessed that conversation? Then? No. no. And your, uh, Mr. Lanier, your husband, says that when you telephoned him on the 28th of January in the evening, um, you told him that you had a concern, but you didn't say, or didn't really say, that Miss Sindhu had a what I think I said is what I just said, is that she did not feel comfortable. And I had a concern because I was new and I thought this is 
a bit strange that it happened now, and the CEO was away, so I just wanted to inform him, because I, as, as far as I knew, nobody else had. Let's so have a look at this, uh, yeah. Mr. Le Maire's witness statement. Sorry, Mr. Le Maire's witness yeah, statement. Tell me and in paragraph 54, if you go one, two, three, four, five, six, seven lines from the bottom of that paragraph, starting Miss Sindhu, it says, Miss Sindhu therefore told Miss Torrin that she was uncomfortable with the new methodology. Although at the time, Miss Tonnell did not tell me that Miss Sindhu had concerns. I think this is exactly what I just said. Well, forgive me. What you just said is that Miss Sindhu, that you told your husband that Miss Sindhu had concerns. No, I think I, I was clear. I said that I had concern and she didn't feel comfortable. And I think you, you should... Uh, so she yeah, no, no, that's what she said. And if you yes. read three lines above that... She said, I understand that. Miss Sindhu was uncomfortable about this. Yes. Um, uh, she's confirming this again. You didn't at any stage mention to your husband that Miss Sindhu had made any reference to figures, did you, in that telephone conversation? Um, I'm, I might have said uh, four million, but uh, this, uh, uh, that's what I think. But uh, then if Mr. Lamia doesn't say four million, it doesn't mean that I didn't say anything. We, we cannot actually say exactly every word that we said in this conversation. It was just to help and say the substance of it. The, the only person who could really corroborate what you're saying now is Miss Cindy, right? Because nobody else was there. Yes, Miss Cindy, yes. Now, If I may say, he didn't accuse, he asked who. Okay. No, he raised, I think, in my witness statement, I think I said, he queried who uh, wanted to change the methodology. I, don't want to know I didn't say you I didn't say you accused, and, and I don't think it's the right word. What is Sorry? your recollection today? That, this is what I'm saying now, is that he queried who had changed the methodology. So he put it neutrally. In front, in front of, of, of the whole uh, assembly. He put it neutrally. Question. I think it is, yeah, because you raised the question, who actually uh, uh, did change the methodology? Let's have a look, please, uh, firstly at your witness statement in yes. Bundle B. say, and it's not what I said uh, previously, I said that he raised the question, okay, and then there is another question, is that why this change has never been discussed with him, and this is addressed to Mr. Lee, who is the CFO. Yes, so so I don't think there is a, uh, anything. Well, we haven't got to your husband's yet. 
You obviously know it very well. No, but no, what I mean is that this one is my statement. Yes. I'm talking about my statement. And here, the first direct question is put to Mr. Lees. Why this change had never been discussed with him. There are two questions here. Yes, one is the open so-called. No, the no, no, there's one is, is, um, he is asked who actually wanted to add another 5.2 million to the revenue. And then he asked to Mr. Lis why he, did, he didn't uh, discuss this with him. I guess because he was the CFO, well, he would have expected let's that. Let's have a look at your husband's statement now. Uh, just keep your finger at the same page of your statement that we just referred to. And my husband, where is the, um, the CEO's your, yeah, statement? Your husband's statement is at tab four. And the relevant paragraph uh, is uh, at 65. Now, at 65 in the second sentence, you say that he says, the first item I wished to discuss was the revenue recognition, as this was the biggest item on the agenda. So that's his wish, in his mind. He then it's says... 5.2 million. It's 5.2 million. Meaning it's the biggest item on the list. Yeah, I didn't mention no. anything about figure. Yeah. Um, he then says, I stated that I understood that PWC had asked for the accounting methodology to be changed, and Miss Cinder immediately said that it wasn't PWC, it was Mr. Lees. That's completely different to the account that you have given, I would suggest, uh, mm -hmm. paragraph 29 and 30. I don't think so, because I said in paragraph 31 that Mrs. Sindhu stated very clearly that this change had not been suggested by them. But that so was I think I say it. That was only after you say, in paragraph 29, that your husband asked Mr. Lees why this change had never been discussed with him. Mr. Lees yes. then explained, paragraph 30 of your statement, that PWC had suggested that El Seco might have to change the methodology for recognising revenue in order to comply with international financial reporting standards. So Mr. Lees gives his explanation, and then Ms. Sindhu says very clearly that this change had not been suggested by them. But in your husband's account, wouldn't you agree that the question is put to PwC, and the answer comes first from PwC? I think it's just a recollection, and I think this is how I understand that, so it's just the way I present it. I'm not sure it makes a, a, a very, uh, I mean, it doesn't mean that one of us is wrong. I don't think so. Well, perhaps it does, I would suggest to you. This is to the court to see. Uh, and um, this, uh, uh, Talon, you uh, are aware, aren't you, that Mr. Lees uh, brought to the meeting a copy of the IFRS rule I am not aware of that. Ah. Uh, and um, following discussions with your husband after this event, did your husband mention that Mr. Lees had brought a copy of the IFRS rules? No, we don't discuss a lot about work. We try not to discuss too much. And this actually was done by my, uh, I was uh, doing this on my own, so we didn't, we didn't discuss this. Are you saying that your husband and you have never discussed the events of the 11th of February? We have, but we have not discussed the FRS paper. And I want to be clear, I was only a part of the first part of the meeting because well, I was part of the financial team. Did, so when Mr. The, the CEO asked me to leave, yeah, I left. The first of the three. The first part of the three meetings. Yes. So if there were papers, and I understand there were papers, it was not in the first part. You understand there were papers? This is from what you actually say. But, but, but have you understood that to be the case from any other source? I think it maybe was uh, said yesterday, maybe. I, I but don't that's your only knowledge of these IFRS papers? Yeah. Is that your evidence? Yeah. Um, so you're only there for the first part of the meeting, you don't see what happens thereafter? In the meeting, no, but I witnessed afterwards. Yes. Uh, and you say that when the claimant left, um, he said, he's fired me. 
He said, I've been fired, can you believe it? Yen Ami said it very loud, and three times at least, and we all were puzzled yeah. by that. But if you had been in the meeting and you had heard your husband say, I could fire you, you wouldn't be so puzzled, would you? I would still be, actually, because I think it was a very uh, strong reaction, and, and to say very loud, I've been fired to the office, I mean, I wouldn't say that, but... Uh, um, isn't it right that, in fact, what Mr. Lee said was, can you believe it? I think he wants to fire me. I, I, do, I don't know the point that, I don't understand the point that Mr. Pierrick was making. So. Is it possible that what Mr. Lee actually was, can you believe it? I think he wants to fire me. No, I, I don't think so. So it has to be the words you have chosen. No, no, no. Uh, what, I'm, what I'm saying is that, to my recollection, to my, the best of my, mem my memory, Mr. Lee said, I have been fired, can you believe it? Then yes. if you want to add something at the end, well, it's no, up to no, you. What I'm suggesting to you is, is it possible you misheard and what Mr. Lee actually said was, can you believe it? I think he wants to fire me. My answer is I don't think I misheard. You don't think you misheard. Uh, and you're aware that Mr. Lees uh, didn't regard himself as being dismissed on the 11th of February. At, at the day, uh, the, the, the day it happened, I didn't know. I mean, I just... But thereafter, you are aware, aren't you, that he said that I want to take holidays? That's what I've been told, but... Uh, but I you have no personal knowledge of that? No, of course. And you had no involvement whatsoever in the dismissal Mr. Lees. No, I didn't have any involvement in that. Now, um, Mr. Nall, I want to just deal with uh, the question of pensions there, because I know you uh, dealt with that in your written statement. Mm -hmm. Can I ask you to turn to bundle C1 in tab 3? C1 in tab 3. <coughs> I guess it's his former employer, yes? Well, the, the, they, they previously owned Elsico, as you know. It was not Spaceco, it was Allianz, wasn't it? Yes, but Spaceco was a subsidiary okay. of Alliance, as you yeah, know, so, yeah. which owned Elsico. Okay, if you wish. Well, and when uh, your husband and Mr. Lee purchased uh, the share capital of the company uh, 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 Elsico uh, from Spaceco, uh, Spaceco no longer owned Elsco, obviously. You, you understand that? Yeah, I do understand yeah, that. Thank you. Uh, and these pay slips take us right up to uh, July 2008, if you look at the last one. It's unclear, mm -hmm. copy, unfortunately. Yeah, yeah. Uh, and you can see that, oh, if you go back to the April, that the first uh, column sets out the various headings 
for contributions uh, that can be made by either the employer or the employee? Mm -hmm. That's a yes. Uh, yes. And then it specifies the, uh, the next column, headed basis. What does that mean? Um. I would guess, I mean, I would guess it's the salary or something, or I don't know. Or part of the salary mm -hmm. that is subject to the deduction. Possibly. And tour, what does that mean? It's the rate. The rate of the deduction. And montant? It's the amount. The amount of the deduction. Uh, and these are, under the heading employer, these set out the employer's contributions, the rate and the actual contribution. Uh, towards these various items here. Mm -hmm. Now, pausing there for a moment, if you look at the witness statement of Mr. Lee's paragraph 173, he says that in paragraph 173, Spaceco had made contributions, pension contributions on my behalf, which varied over the years, depending on the changing rates and parameters set by the French government. For example, in May 2007, the total pension contributions amounted to euros 286, sorry, 2826.55 per month. The contributions can be identified from the samples payslip from May 2007 by reference to the following payments. And he lists those acronyms there, uh, and those are the acronyms that you see under the heading Libella, uh, I hope I'm not I'm pronouncing that terribly wrong. Libéré, uh, yeah, but it's, it's not, we don't take a French cross, it's okay. Okay, so he says that's the total value of the contributions that were made towards his pension scheme by Spaceco uh, and subsequently uh, by Elsco. Uh, I don't understand that. I see a payslip that is uh, from a French employee with a, by a French firm, so okay, and yes, that's all I see. But do you understand that Mr. Lisa's case is that the terms and conditions relating to pension that he enjoyed whilst employed by Spaceco are the same terms and conditions that he should have enjoyed when he became the owner of Elsico with your husband and an employee. Actually, I don't understand all that because I'm a bit puzzled that uh, somebody who's resident in Dubai, employee of a Dubai-based uh, company, would have exactly the same um, uh, benefits because it's, I don't think it's possible to have exactly the same benefits. However, what, what I can say is that ELSCO contributed to the uh, French uh, pension for Mr. Le Maire and I think it was actually um, um, organized by, by uh, Mr. Lee. So what I see now in ELSCO, because I cannot comment on SpaceCo, is that there was a constant uh, contribution to a pension for Mr. Lee by ELSCO and it was a French pension. Are, are you able to dispute that the acronyms that he's referred to are pension contributions? I, I'm not disputing that. I have, I have uh, very uh, little work in France, so I'm, I'm, I'm not very familiar with these terms. Yes, but, but that's his evidence, that all the payments in the itemized payslip under these headings relate to pension payments to his French pension scheme at the time. When he was employed in a French firm, yes. Correct. Uh, and thereafter, if we can just look at a document that's called the assignment letter, which is in French, and I believe it's in uh, in uh, first bundle. Sorry, uh, bundle C one. So is it the one I have? Bundle C one. Three. So is, is the tab I have? Okay. Still? C1? Is that C1? Okay. Yeah. Still with the. So if you go to tab. Sorry, forgive me. Uh, it should be tab 1 of oh. bundle C1. Okay, fine. Okay. Okay. This is in French, so it should be straightforward for you, but not so straightforward for Yeah, Christmas. though I haven't read this document before, so straightforward, but I would need to read whatever. Oh, you haven't read this before? No. Oh.
see that this document is essentially a secondment contract for Mr. Lease uh, to Spaceco in Dubai to start on the 1st of June 2007. Can you, we can call it a mission. Yeah. Well, I think you can translate this and tell us what you want from out of it. Yeah. I, just want, I just need to establish that, she, that the witness understands that first. Yeah. Um, you sent on a mission, yeah. Effectively. Yeah. So it's a so is, yes? Yeah. Uh, and if you go to uh, page 467. say 7.4? 7.4. And that's the uh, CFE, the Casse de France de l'Etranger. Yes. Yeah. And what Mr. Lee says is that pension scheme, which is a well-known one in France for employees, mm -hmm. is the same scheme that contributions that I've referred to with the various actors paragraph 173 of his witness statement were being made to. That's what he says. Uh, first, Caisse des Français à l'étranger is for uh, people who don't reside in France. Yes. Uh, and, and so you refer to, one, you refer to a contract uh, in France for a French employee, and then you refer to another uh, yeah, type of employment contract. Yes, yes. So I'm, I'm not seeing the, the, the link here. And I don't know. Well, you'll see that the contribution made in the case of it, you're not disputing that those were made from I, May 2007, just beginning, uh, May 2007, uh, whilst the claimant was employed by Elsico, sorry, by Space Coast in Dubai. Yeah, because he was on a mission, yeah, he was sent out. Yeah, he was sent out of France, yeah. So those contributions were still being paid on his behalf towards this French pension scheme whilst he was in Dubai. Yes, by space uh, Which is precisely what uh, CFP enables to occur. Mm -hmm. uh, and so uh, Mr. Leith says that the contributions of 2,000, whatever it is, 600 euros per month were made towards the CFP by Spaceco on his behalf. Yes, it's uh, the French company who pays uh, the French, uh, yeah. And, and he says, uh, and you're aware there's no written in, uh, in, in this case provided uh, by, uh, uh, by Elsico, you've heard that evidence already. I've just heard, yes. So what we have, I think you're aware, is Appendix 2 of the SCA, which recalls certain employment terms. You've seen that, haven't you? Yeah, I mean, I haven't gone through the detail of the SCA, but yeah, I know there is reference to some contract. And it makes reference to a pension in that SCA, doesn't it? In the appendix two, most probably yes. Uh, and so the only pension that it can, could be referred to is the CFE pension, given that he's in Dubai at the time. Thing is, uh, I think. But that's right, though, isn't it? It's a matter of simple logic. But then, if that's what the CFE is for, for non residents But in CFE, in this case, the Français à l'étranger, you would have different pension schemes, and and. And I cannot say that what is written in the SCA uh, refers exactly to uh, all the, the detail on the space for payslips. I, I cannot say that. Yeah. Well, the, the only pension contributions, let me ask you this, how much was the pension contribution uh, to the uh, CFB um, that you refer to in your board statement? What's the total value of that contribution per month? I, I wouldn't know the exact uh, amount because it's, uh, we usually pay for two or three employees at the time. So. I mean, if you want the exact number, I could check and tell you the exact number. But I know that Elsco is paying a pension to Mr. Lee. It has been paying 
yes. uh, from but 2009 to 2000. That isn't disputed to the Lordship. The question is whether all the correct pension contributions have been made to the CFP on his behalf by Oxico. Uh, and you're not able to tell us what the actual monthly contribution is. No, I, I, don't, I don't understand what is correct. What do you mean by correct? I'm sorry. Uh, so, uh, I, I appreciate you're not in a position to dispute this, but I have to put my client's case to you. Uh, Elsico was obliged to pay him 2,682, whatever it was, Mr. Lewis, uh, witness statement, or the equivalent amount adjusted year on year. So if you didn't know the figure, why you insist she should know that figure? No, we know the figure. It's in the witness statement. I just can't remember exactly what I mean, she said it's in the record as well. Right. She said the figure in the record as well. She just said exactly what you said. You refer to witness statement for the correct figure. Yes. She referred to the record for the correct figure as well. Yes. Yes. I see no differences between right. both of you and referring to the right figure. Uh, well, yeah. in that case, I'll, 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 leave, uh, I'll leave that there. Now, Miss. Um, on, you, you see what Mr. Lee says in his witness statement, no doubt you've read it. Yeah. Uh, you have read it? I have read it. You see what he says about his expenses, and I see there's a fundamental disagreement between the two of you about that. Of course there is, yeah. Uh, and you're going to disagree with everything I put to you that's in his witness statement. No, I will disagree if you tell me something that I should disagree with, but I, I cannot say that I'm going to disagree with everything. Uh, I'm going to suggest to you that everything in his witness statement regarding expenses is correct, and what you have said is not then what I say I think is correct. Uh, I mean, so there's no dialogue, maybe. Okay, thank you very much. Second, any question? No re-examination, my lord. Well, thank you very much, Mr. Law. You may leave the book. Thank you. Take just a short break yes, before sure. we come back with your witness. Our witness is here now. Yes, ma'am. All right. Yeah. 
Um, so can I just have one moment? I've just got to get my papers sorted out. Um, Yes, Mr. Chaudhary, you may call your witness. Yes, um, I'm going to mispronounce his surname. I'm just giving you advance warning for that. Yes. Uh, I call Mr. Eric Van George. I got that completely wrong. I'm so sorry. whereby Almighty God to tell the truth and nothing but the truth. Signed at page uh, 2805. It is? And uh, you signed to confirm the statement of truth above paragraph 73. Indeed. Um, after that, subsequently, uh, you have produced alongside Mr. Hargreaves a joint statement.
Yes, I have it. And once again, there's a statement of truth on the last page, 2004L, which you have signed. Yes. And uh, you have signed to confirm the statement of truth. Indeed. Your Lordship, I do have supplementary questions, but they really, and I'll be open and frank here, they relate to uh, the additional matters that were contained in our addendum, which you refused permission to adduce. Yes. Um, may I ask questions relating to matters within that addendum report? No. So, no further questions. Um, Thank you. Remain there, there'll be some more questions. Yes, Mr. Kim. Um, good morning. Is, is it okay if I call you Eric? Safe ease, um, if you wish. Um, can we start off by? Uh, can you be fair? Yes. Can uh, we start off by establishing some hopefully common terminology? Uh, what is deferred income? Deferred income. Deferred income or deferred uh, revenue, perhaps. Um, so perhaps I can uh, just explain that by uh, the best way to explain it, uh, Your Lordship, is probably by uh, a couple of examples. Uh, so no, that's not my question. I need a definition. Um, oh, you need technical definition. Yes, an accountancy definition accountancy. of deferred revenue. The uh, I don't. I'm not sure that in the in the in the there is a technical definition of deferred revenue uh, in, uh, in in IFRS. Obviously, it's uh, it's the revenue that's not taken into account in the definition of revenue within. IFRS, uh, which is why I wanted to give uh, your Lordship uh, two examples uh, of... Uh, to simplify. To yeah. simplify, to explain better to the court what is meant by deferred revenue. Am I able to explain those? Yes, go ahead. Yes. Thank you. So first of all, the first example might be uh, if uh, a garage sells a, a car, uh, and with that car uh, he sells a, a one-year warranty on the car. Now that garage would be wrong to recognise uh, the whole revenue on uh, the warranty and because that warranty is spread across the whole of one year. And so he should spread that revenue across the whole of the year as well. Uh, similarly, if I was to um, subscribe to a satellite TV uh, subscription which lasts one year, the satellite company uh, would receive the cash up front uh, but shouldn't recognise that as revenue because it refers to the whole year and therefore they should spread the revenue across the whole of that year. So in essence, uh, we're talking about cash that's been received. You may have started some work on the, uh, on the particular area, um, but you haven't completed the work or you haven't done a, a substantial amount of the work. Um, so you haven't done the work um, and therefore we shouldn't uh, recognise the revenue. Or you shouldn't, or you just call it deferred. You shouldn't recognise the revenue. You should not recognise. No, you should not recognise, unless you've done the work relating to that service. Um, so, if I may, in the context of uh, Elsco, uh, I would suggest to your lordship that deferred revenue, uh, as uh, defined in accountancy terms, is probably not a big issue, because by the time Elsco gets the money in. Uh, the balance premium, it's done most of the work already. Uh, so the idea that uh, you know they get the cash up front and they haven't done the work is less relevant to, to Elsco. What is more relevant to Elsco is the extent to which that work um, has been done before the payment is received. That is the issue with, with Elsco and that is uh, the, the fundamental uh, logic of accruals based accounting that you should recognize the revenue as and when you perform the work and not necessarily uh, when you obtain the cash and how we still need to understand understand that in light of there is a still risk of launch of the rocket the satellite itself sorry even if the money is paid up front there is, like, even in our scenario, in the case before us, there is what calls something, risk of the launch of the rocket, of everything. So, just to clarify that on your lordship, uh, so um, 
the risk that you're referring to, I believe, is the risk that something goes wrong yep. with the satellite uh, from the beginning of the launch to when it's in orbit. Yep. Um, now that risk, uh, there is a risk, but that risk is a risk for an insurer. Uh, it's the insurer that uh, has to pay out if anything goes wrong with that satellite. Yes. Um, and ELSCO, of course, is not an insurer. Yes. It's an intermediary. Mm -hmm. It arranges the insurance. It doesn't have to refund its premium uh, or the money it gets if something goes wrong with that satellite. Yes. Um, what, are yes, a, Mr. what are accruals? Accruals. Accruals? Yes. Uh, accruals, uh, for example, uh, um, an accrual is something that uh, uh, is a liability that you would take into account in your balance sheet at the year at the, uh, the end of an accounting period where, uh, where uh, that liability uh, has yet to be paid and you need to accrue for it in your balance sheet on an accrual basis. What is cost accounting? What is cost accounting? Yes. Um, cost accounting is you need to account for your costs on a. On a is that recording? Yeah, you need to account for your costs on a accruals basis. Um, in terms of revenue recognition, I think um, everyone's agreed that the bulk of the work is done at the inception of the policy. Correct. Uh, I agree. And that's when the policy is signed up. I agree. You don't recognise revenue when the policy is signed up. You, it's once, in fact, if you if you're strictly looking at the IFRS rules, you would uh, recognise or you could recognise the revenue when the work is carried out. So uh, I agree uh, with uh, Mr. Kemp. Uh, that if the work is carried out, and he's just confirmed that, that most of the work is carried out before the policy is signed. I agree with that. Yeah. So you could, there was a case for saying you could, under the accruals basis, recognize revenue earlier uh, at the time the policy is signed. It depends how much remaining work is to be done. Yeah, but in terms of what happened at Elsico, they, they, everyone's agreed that they didn't recognize revenue when the policy was signed up. That's, that's actually true. Yeah. Um, and so there is a could point. I, could I reply to that? I think you just yeah. answered my question and want to ask another question. Yeah, right. so could, I, could I? Well, yes. I complete go, my go reply. On. Thank you. Um, so could you reformulate that with that interruption? So I've lost my train of thought. Oh. So. Yeah. Repeat the question. I think in terms of what happened at Elsico, I think everyone's agreed that you don't recognise revenue when the policy is signed up. That's right. The policy at Elsco, I said they could have done, they didn't. I'm not proposing they did recognise the revenue when the yeah. policy was signed. Yeah. What they did do uh, was seek to recognise the revenue uh, at the date of the proposed launch. Well, we'll move on to that in a minute, but so if they don't recognise revenue when the policy is signed up, and so there is a point in time in the future when revenue will be recognised after the policy has been signed up. Sorry, could you repeat that question? Sorry. Elsico doesn't recognise revenue when the policy is signed up. Mm -hmm. We're agreed on that. And so from the date that the policy is signed up, there will be a point in time in the future when revenue will be recognised by Elsico in respect to that policy. After the policy is signed up. Yes. You say that in practice, that point in time was the estimated launch date, the proposed launch date. That's their state of accounting policy. It's your, it's your, um, there's a dispute It's not mine, it's stated in, uh, in note 2.10 well, of the accounts in 2010, 11 and 12. Yeah. The experts disagree on this point, but your expert evidence is that in practice, that point in time when revenue was recognised was the estimated launch date, correct? I think I've, I've, I've said what I've some stated. Poli some, policies, some policies have a launch date, correct? Some policies, uh, in, in general, the, uh, the policies, as I understand, uh, uh, set out a proposed launch date. 
but some, some would indeed sometimes a proposed launch period. Yes, uh, and a proposed launch date can be changed by the owner. The launch can be deferred, yes. And it can be changed when the owner, whenever the owner wants. We're changed in, in line with uh, when uh, the uh, uh, when the owner thinks he's going to be able to launch the. Uh, and, and so the word proposed is constantly moving, isn't it? Because it can be modified by the owner. You said the word proposed. The word. the word proposed is constantly moving as a concept because it can be modified at any time by the owner. It can be modified, but the proposed launch date as set out in the policy uh, does not change. There's no certainty with a proposed launch date. Of course, otherwise it wouldn't just be proposed. And a, a proposed what I'm saying is that the proposed launch date is the one that's set out in the policy. Well, that, that's your reading of the word proposed. We say it's OTOs, but just to test your expert evidence that this was the policy in practice at Elsico and the logic underpinning that, would you agree with this proposition that the proposed date and the actual launch date converge at the launch? The proposed launch date is set out in the policy and the actual launch date are different. But would you agree that the proposed launch date is an arbitrary date, a thing written water because it can be changed by the owner whenever they want? It's not an arbitrary date, it's the, it's the date on which at the sign of the signing of the policy. So in this context, there was like fixed date, can we say? Yes. No, your, your, your evidence is that it's an estimated date. That's what you say in your yes, but it's expert estimated. report. But I agree with, uh, with your lordship is that it's fixed as if it's mentioned in the uh, insurance policy. Yeah. But if it can be changed whenever the owner wants, all it is is just an intention, isn't it, rather than anything else? Well, I think that's semantics. And you've already accepted that there's no certainty with an estimated launch. Yeah, but in that context, nothing is certain. Everything can well, change. My Lord, for reason or another, like even the intervention, the first major or anything my, else. My Lord, what is certain is the risk. Because, uh, Eric, would you not agree that in the space insurance business, that what is certain is that risk attaches at the launch of the rocket? As I explained to the court earlier on, uh, the risk relating to uh, a satellite once it's launches started and goes into orbit is uh, the risk for the insurer. Elsco is not a, an insurer and therefore but the, uh, but the Elsco is not at risk. It but doesn't have to pay back its premiums if something goes wrong in space. But the policy clearly, um, clearly uh, connects revenue recognition with the risk yeah, but that for collection of money. And I'm, I'm suggesting to the expert that um, that is because um, that is a certain event rather than an arbitrary date, as in the case with an intended or estimated launch date. I disagree. I think, uh, you know, just to, to try and bring some more clarity for your lordship, yeah. the, the essence of uh, what's happening is has the work been carried out or not? Uh, and if it's been carried out, then you should be able to recognise the revenue. The Alisco's work, you mean here? Alisco's work, the defendant's work. Sorry? You talk about the defendant's work, Alisco. Yeah, Alisco, yeah. yes. It's done by signing the yeah. policy. That's what well, you Once it's signed the policy, its work has basically been done. Yeah. It's done its job. Yeah. Uh, there may be some extra things to be carried out after the signing of the policy, but in general, those would be insignificant, is my understanding. But, but and so, having established that they've carried out the work and that they would be able to recognise the revenue, yeah. uh, they've decided that um, we, that the, the company, can then recognise it as at the date of the proposed launch, which is after the date of the policy. Uh, and that seems perfectly reasonable to me, and that is what I understand uh, that they have, they have done. Eric, on your um, what, what would your on your logic, what would happen if the launch was cancelled to the revenue? Because you would say that because the work had already been done, 
it can be recognised that if the launch is cancelled, they can ask for their money back. Uh, they can ask for their money back. I would say, in the context of the accounting, uh, what is the probability of the, uh, uh, the economic benefits flowing to the company? That is the criteria for IFRS under accruals, uh, under the recognition of revenue. So it doesn't mean certainty. You don't have to definitely know you're going to get the money. Uh, you have to be uh, you have to make a judgment as to whether it's, it's probable or not that you're going to get those those benefits in. Um, and I understand that uh, the number of cases uh, where once there is a proposed launch date, the number of cases uh, where a launch doesn't go ahead at any future time is, is very small. And if that's the case, then you retain the fact that there is still a high probability uh, that everything will go ahead and you'll get paid. I want to move on to uh, another topic, which is what Elsico did in the past, so 2010, 2011, 2012, 2010, 2011. The accounting manual, I think everyone has agreed, says revenue is recognised when cash is received. You describe that as step one in your report. Do you agree? The accounting manual repeats the uh, first of all the policy which is set out in, in the 2.10 in the accounts. Um, but I do agree that uh, uh, at the end it says uh, revenue or pro pro proportional revenues uh, 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 will be recognised on a cash basis. And if we That's a cash rule, and uh, yes, I, I totally agree uh, with uh, Mr. Kent's proposition that that is uh, a step one in the process. They, they do that. They do that, uh, as I understand it, for for ease of for practicality reasons. During the year, there will be many cases um, when they've done the work and they get the cash in, and there's no discrepancy between the two. And so, as far as I understand it, they book everything into the proportional revenue database on a cash basis. Um, and I think and then in step two... Well, if I can... If I well, can, you, you asked the question. If I can put the next question. No, I was asking no, no, if no, I no, wait, let wait, me wait. complete my answer. Uh, yes. Is that all right? Yes. Thank thanks. you very much. So the step one would be the cash rule during the year. Well, for ease of practicality, uh, we uh, account for it on a cash basis. And then afterwards, uh, there's a review to see whether there's any big discrepancies between the cash rule and, uh, uh, and comparing whether there are any large projects where work has been done but the cash hasn't been received. And that would be in step two, you know, which would be very much in line with making sure that the, uh, uh, the accruals-based accounting required under IFRS is complied with. But the, that's, that would be a process of adjustments by which the revenue figure could be increased or decreased. He said revision. He said revision. Step two is a revision. So the company revised if they could recognize it. Yes. Well, I want you to turn to 2823, which is um, a table in the defendant's expert report. Um, so we're in um, bundle D. Two, eight, two, three. That's right. So tab two is the report of Neil Hargreaves. And this is paragraph 3.6 of Mr. Hargreaves' report. And the, uh, it contains a table. And the table lists cases between 2010 and 2012 where the launch date has been postponed to the following year. Now, I want you to assume that the underlying information for this table has not been challenged and is correct. On that assumption... Well, that's that's what assumption what why should I assume that? Well, because it hasn't. Um, my little friend hasn't challenged the... Um, the, the documentary evidence that's referred to uh, as exhibits that makes up the table. Well, how can I? Because that witness hasn't given evidence yet. Well, 
Mr. Yes. Yeah. Mr. There is no closing submission yet. Mr. L Mr. Le Maire has provided a second witness statement which um, sets all these documents out in some detail about well, these bits. You, you say that, but my client has provided a witness statement which provides different information to that which is contained in here. Yeah, I think and there is. And with all of these satellites. There is still time so for them to challenge if they wish. Well, um, if it's just if we start with on the if we start with this on the yes. assumption that the information is correct, the table doesn't the table show that revenue is recognised in the year the balance of the premium is received in respect of postponed launches. Uh, well, certainly uh, I'd, I'd be very happy to explain to you, to your lordship, uh, but I don't accept the assumption that uh, everything in that table is correct. So let me let me uh, let me give you an example of one of the. the uh, well, I'm not asking. I'm not actually asking you that question yeah. because. But I think I've helped to clarify the no. situation for. Oh no, no, stick to his question. Because for you, yeah. I asked you to assume that the information in the table is correct. Well, on he, that said no. he said no. He said no. He says no, but yeah. I'm asking him to, for the purposes of my question, assume the question is about logic rather see, than yeah, evidence. Okay. Assume that the information in the table is correct. On that assumption, doesn't this table show that re re revenue is recognised in the year the balance of the premium is received in respect of postponed launches? This is uh, obviously. So you're saying the balance of the premium received is recognised in the same year as the recognition of revenue? Well, it's the other way around, isn't it? The year of revenue recognition is in the same year that the balance of the premium is received. Again, I think, that's, that, I think that's semantics. No, we're, we're talking about the same. That's what the, this table shows. That's on the assumption that I have to take it as read. Now, are you able to give any clear example supported by documentary evidence to put, that's put before this court of revenue recognition in the case of postponed or future launches where Elsico has not received the balance of the premium and a request for return of the premium has not been made? I can say that we've made reference to uh, a number of uh, Satellites and insurance policies in in, in, in my report. Yeah. Um, if if I had the opportunity of uh, uh, yes, yeah, so so on on on, on the asset, uh, I would I would highlight the asset. Uh, what I would say about um, uh, the asset one. So there were two uh, two satellites A and B, uh, but in fact there were uh, there were. There were different insurance covers in respect to those two satellites. Uh, first of all, there were uh, sort of classical uh, insurance coverage, uh, which was covering the launch plus the first year in orbit, so L plus one. Uh, secondly, uh, there was a, a policy uh, or coverage uh, referred to as uh, uh, the, the double total loss policy. And thirdly, there was uh, some coverage relating to Takaful, but I won't go into those unless it's required. Uh, the issue uh, on, uh, uh, on the double total loss uh, is an example where uh, the revenue uh, relating to uh, this particular uh, insurance cover had been accounted for in 2010, uh, but the cash balance premium had been received in 2011 um, and that, that is an example uh, which is uh, in contradiction to Mr Kemp's supposition. But, but that's example on the contrary um, the 30% deposit was recognised in the year of receipt and the balance was recognised in the year of the launch and so far from being an exception to this pattern it is demonstrative of the rule would you agree? No, I don't. Um, the reason why I don't agree is that I understand that the total commission for the asset double total loss amounted to 575,000. Um, and I understand that 555,000, 550,000 approximately, 
uh, was accounted for in 2010. It's true that there had been some cash uh, which was received in 2010 relating to the deposit. Um, but that was not the only part of the revenue that was recognised in 2010. As you can see, out of a total of 575, they recognised 550 approximately in 2010, mm -hmm. which is whatever it is, 90%. And in respect of that year, in fact, of that 550,000 represented 10, 11, 12 percent of the total fixed income commission that the company recognised in that year. So it's a significant amount. Mm -hmm. The DTLA was a unique arrangement, wasn't it? It was a slightly different arrangement to the, uh, the classic uh, it's the only, insurance. It's the only DTLO example you've seen in, in this case, isn't it? It's the only example I've seen in this case. Um, the, can you think of any other clear examples? Um, of um, cases of future launches where Alstico has not received the balance of the premium? Uh, yes, uh, there's uh, uh, Arian, Arian Spats, uh, which occur, and I highlighted this in my report, which, uh, but related to 2007. What, what you've uh, seven. Yeah. But, that, but that was 2007, an early example. Point but one. an example, nevertheless, which represented uh, at least nearly 40% of uh, fixed income commission in that year. So again, very significant. And if I may add, that in terms of materiality for the company and a potential audit of that company, uh, those wouldn't just be able to pass by unnoticed. Mm. Um, and that was a non-refundable deposit recorded as a fee? Uh, I understand that that was, uh, was an amount First of all, the amount was received in 2008 and the, rec the revenue was recognised in 2007. That's the first thing I, I, would, I, would, say, I would say. Um, and those, uh, uh, that, that amount of money, as I understand it, was to cover uh, under a framework contract the first four uh, launches under the Arian Spas programme. Uh, um, so it wasn't a deposit in the sense that Mr. Kemp is referring to, it was more like an advance relating to the whole of the premium relating to the first four launches. And those are the only two examples of my um, hypothesis, aren't they? Because the others are ones where the balance of the premium has been paid but there's been no request for a refund, so SS14 Nigeria sat, sat next. And the Amazonas example is where the balance was received but the refund was requested, which is a different point, isn't it? No, no, I would disagree. First of all, with the first proposition that there aren't any other examples, because there are, and those I highlight in, in my report uh, relating to uh, Aspen and Hilax, uh, these are policies where clearly, uh, because it was shown in the receivables in the accounts, i.e. they hadn't received the cash, it was in the balance sheet as a receivable, um, nevertheless, they had recognised recognize the revenue in, 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 in that year, which is 2010 again. But Aspen was, was um, an example of um, a policy where the, where the launch had already taken place, and so it was recorded as a receivable in the accounts. What do you mean the launch has already taken mm. place? So, well, so all launches should, should have taken place. No, they, they it's, get, it's revised time, isn't it? They get, they get the money. If I put it in crude terms, yeah. they get the money after the launch on that occasion and as such it's recorded as a receivable, it's not recognised as revenue. But, but your proposition is that, uh, that they shouldn't recognise revenue until the balance premium is, uh, is received and uh, I disagree with that. It's recorded and in I've given you four examples already. It's, it's uh, not Aspen. Well, that's not the case. But, but do you agree that Aspen is an example, not an example of um, a case of postponed or future launches, um, but, but an example of, of one where the launch had already taken place and then the money comes in. The launch had already taken place, but still, the cash hadn't been received and yet they recognised the revenue. So it's not actually an example of the, um, of the question that I've put to you, is it? No, I think it's an example, as I say again, of uh, where the, the revenue had been recognised before the cash had been received. And so really what we have 
is the DTLO and Ariane Space, and they were they were both recorded as non-proportional revenues. Do you agree? First of all, there, there, were, there were the four examples I've given. Sorry, just to so answer my question, I will, DTLO I will and Space, the question. they were recorded as non-proportional revenue, weren't they? Are you answering now? Or you want him to answer? I want him to confirm the answer to that question, my lord. Well, we had an assumption, which was that you only gave two examples, and he's trying to say, well, I gave four examples. Yeah. But of, of those four, the DTLO and Ariane Space were recorded as non proportional revenues in the accounts. So, can I recommence my yeah. the answer? So, I disagree that there are just two examples, there were at least four. Um, and in and that four? Sorry? In that four example? Yeah. So, in those four, what I'm saying is that, Your Lordship, my review has not been exhaustive. Uh, and therefore, you know, had I had access to the company's records and done an exhaustive review, there may have been others. That's the only point I wanted to make to, you, to your lordship. Uh, so, turning to the question of Mr. Kemp, uh, which uh, he's, which perhaps you can just repeat again. Well, it's quite a specific question. The, did you repeat your, again that from, specific from your question? research, the DTLO and Ariane Space, that, that the revenue was recorded as non-proportional revenue in those cases. Are you saying in all examples he giving the revenues were recorded and proportionate? No, in the two of two the of four, the four of the four, yeah. DTLO and Ariane space were yeah. recorded as non-proportional revenues. It's a straightforward question for this expert to answer. Model. Which is which is very good. I'll try and give a straightforward answer. So uh, on the on the DTLO, what I understand happened is that uh, you recall earlier, Your Lordship, I said that the proportional revenue database is used when the cash is received. Yeah. Okay, and that's to say yeah. money needs to buy. So the GTLO is an example, as I said before, of where the cash hasn't been received and yet they want to record the revenue. Okay. Uh, I believe it's for that reason uh, that initially the GTLO policy was recognised in non proportional revenues. Yeah. So the answer to my question is yes. I haven't finished my answer, if you, yeah. if you will allow me. And if you looked at 2011, so there's no question that the, the DTLO revenues were in 2010. If you then look at 2011, uh, they get the cash, uh, and therefore it's booked in the proportional revenue database. And what they do is then reverse out uh, the entry in a non-proportional revenue database. So that's just a reclassification. Fundamentally, this was proportional revenue that was coming in 2010. So, does the company choose to name it something else? Yeah, because they, they're used to, historically, using the proportional re the revenue database to reflect the cash that's coming in. And in terms of the accounts, it doesn't make any difference because there's, in, in the financial statements, there's no distinction in the numbers between the two. Well, um, I think you all, so the sum total of your evidence is four examples, um, which uh, I think we've been to, been through, um, against table at 3.6, which has 13 cases where, um, with postponed or delayed launches, the revenue is recognised on receipt of the cash. What? He just yes. got you an example where the otherwise could happen. He's got, well, he's given four examples, my lord of what he would describe as exceptions to 3.6. Would 4 is not enough to be exceptional for 13 or 12 cases? That's making them almost like a quarter of this number. Well, four, up to 4, uh, not a quarter, but um, there are 13 cases, so less than a quarter. Um, and then if we turn to page... Well, they're, your, they're very good examples of what I understand the process to be. Step one, cash flow. Step two, do a review of uh, cases uh, to ensure that the revenues are accrued properly. The next question. And second. then, if you turn to page two eight three seven of Mr. Hargreaves uh, in the bundle, Mr. Hargreaves' report. This is a recreation of the 
launches that um, the defendant says the claimant was referring to in the email to PwC, the 5.2 million email to reach that figure, and you've got there a very long list. Sorry, are we in 2837? 2837. Appendix 3. Of how the 5.2 million has been reached, and it's a very long list of satellites, isn't it? A list of satellites, yes. That rather, rather more than a collection of four examples. So what's the question? Sorry. So this is the this is uh, my lord, um, how the 5.2 million in the email from Mr. Lees has been calculated in respect of these um, satellites. And the question is, it's a rather longer list, isn't it, than just a small collection of four examples that you rely on to say that revenue is recognised for postponed or future launches, even where Elsico has not received the balance of the premium. It's a longer list. And so, but I would reiterate what I said earlier in terms of uh, the value of those two examples, Yasa and Arian Spass, in proportion to the total fixed income uh, revenues in those years yeah. is very significant. I want to move on to another topic, which is just uh, briefly your um, CV. So, 2810. 2810. So, we're still in the same bundle. Yeah. My Lord will be uh, familiar with. Um, with, the, with, with what you were asked to opine on, because he was the one that ordered the expert reports. Um, and um, the, uh, the, um, the order says, um, an opinion on the matter of accounting and auditing and then to assist the court in understanding whether the approach to revenue recognition proposed by the claimant inflated revenue in the draft 2013 accounts and whether that approach is consistent with the previous accounting years and international accounting standards. I can see from your CV that you're a fellow of the Association of Charter Certificate Accountants, correct? Um, I'm a fellow of the Association of Chartered Certified Accountants. So, yes, and you have... Okay. Um, you, um, have 20 years of experience in financial advisory services. I think that's more than that I've had up to date, but yes. Yeah. But looking at the list of your representative engagements, we can see that you've done lots of arbitrations and so on um, as an economic and valuation expert, that is, valuing the losses of those uh, in, in, in a breach, flowing from breach of contracts or construction uh, disputes, is that right? Yeah. And we can see over page of 2811 um, lots of examples of that in your international experience and so on. Yes. But you don't in the CV hold yourself out as uh, an expert on CFOs from an audit or compliance perspective. Um, it's correct, that's not reflected in the CV. And if we just help me with this, have a look at the joint statements that... Um, Can I just complete my question on, on, on that, um, Your Lordship? Yes, and we need to... Yeah. If, if, in fact, uh, you know, I, I, I had covered everything that I've done throughout my career, uh, then there would be a, a more, of, more of a little book rather than five, five or six pages of, of CV. Um, so, you know, first, first of all... Uh, when you, when you qualify as an accountant in the UK, and particularly with this association, you have to uh, have had a certain amount of auditing experience, uh, otherwise you wouldn't be able to get the qualification. Um, so I'm sorry it's not reflected in, in, the, in, the, in, the, in the CV, but obviously what I'm saying is I have uh, auditing experience. Uh, but that was years ago, wasn't it? Was it would be years ago? Yes. When did I start your career? Of course, when I started my career. Rather than I qualified quite a long time ago. That's true. But you're not you're not an expert in auditing or compliance, are you? Uh, so what I want to say, uh, your lordship, is that I had auditing experience. Yes, quite a while ago. Yeah. 
Um, but then throughout my career, uh, whether it's in the context of evaluation, in the context of uh, an arbitration, in the context of recovery work, or even in the context of uh, transactions, and I've had experience in all those fields. Um, we're constantly reviewing uh, audit papers, work files, approaches adopted by uh, auditors. Uh, we're constantly uh, looking at uh, uh, the actions of a CFO. Um, those all fall in, within the remit. Um, if a company, if, if someone comes to me and says to me, um, we're looking to buy this company in a transaction, um, he would expect feedback from me on the quality of that CFO. Um, and if he hadn't been doing the things that, uh, uh, that uh, he should have been doing in the context of the company, then we would go back to our client and said, you know, we've done the financial due diligence, we've done the market due diligence, and also you've asked us to uh, give you an opinion on the quality of the CFO. Uh, I've certainly done that on numerous occasions, every, every, and not many, many years ago. That's right. You, you were instructed as an expert in the field of accountancy and auditing. Why didn't you mention any of this experience in, in, your, in your CV? By, in hindsight, if I knew it was going to be an issue, I would have mentioned it in my CV. And, and just help me with this, at, at the joint statement, first of all, you were here in court, weren't you, when Mr. Lees was being cross-examined on Monday? And that was before you signed your joint statement. Um, let me just recall when, because there was a joint statement which was signed. Uh, I think. Well, I can jog, jog your memory of that. Um, page 3004L. 3004L. So. It's all the way at the back of tab two, basically. Yeah. 9th of June. Yes, it's um, 9th of June. Just your signature there, the 9th of June, that was yesterday. So you had signed this statement after you had sat in court uh, listening to the claimant's cross examination, correct? Uh, this well, particular one, yes. That both experts signed at the same time, isn't it? Yes, I'm asking yes. this expert as to him. He said yes. He said yes. I've signed this now, statement. I would just like to point out to your lordship that uh, there's been a whole process, of course. You know, don't just come up with a joint statement and sign it. Uh, the whole process has been going on uh, since um, Thursday last week or something like that in terms of trying to get the joint statement uh, uh, out. So we had the Deloitte report on the 1st of June. Uh, we had to have time to consider that. By the Thursday of that week, um, we started the initial discussion between the experts, and there were numerous drafts. Uh, yeah. And by and large, the draft had been finalised uh, on the Sunday evening. More but, or you, less. But, but Eric, you could. And there was, in, in addition, uh, there was also a version of the joint statement, which the Lordship may well have been aware of, yeah. which had been signed before the 9th of June, um, but needed modification to take references to our addendum out of it. But and the it only difference between this one based the 9th of June and the one before were those are references to the addendum. Yes. But, uh, Eric, let's be clear that you could have added to or modified your joint statement after you had attended the first day of this trial on Monday and before you signed this final statement and lodged it with the court. Uh, I could have, but of course uh, the expert for the, uh, the other side would have noticed that and we've no doubt had discussions on such changes. And, and what's wrong with that? Mr. Well, I've got a couple of points to put to the expert um, you know, on the joint statement, and so it is going somewhere. But, but I confirm um, that I didn't. Well, um, 3004D. Yeah. Is your... Um, your opinion three. about item three in 3004D. Yeah. You give your opinion as to the generic duties of a CFO. Mm -hmm. And then item eight at 3004I. Mm -hmm. 
is a subject that's the claimant's communications with the auditors. Yes. And your you are EVD in your the column to the far right, mm. and you say it's for the honourable court to determine, etc. But then over the page at 3004J. You say, in my opinion, it is appropriate for the CFO to have reviewed and discussed with the auditors such policies to identify whether there was a significant difference between a cash-based accounting approach and the accruals approach required by IFRS. See that? Yes. Firstly, that's not an opinion in your initial report, correct? So we just submit. Could you repeat that question, sir? So Firstly, very this, opi on, this on. opinion. Let's be clear. Three hundred and four J, where you say, in my opinion, it is appropriate for the CFO to have reviewed and discussed with the auditors such policies to identify whether there was a significant difference between a cash-based accounting approach and so on. That opinion is not in your expert report, is it, Eric? Um, actually, uh, maybe not as in clear terms as, as that, but the opinion that I provide in my report is that uh, I reviewed the uh, uh, email exchanges uh, between, uh, uh, between, uh, between the parties, the CFO, uh, the accounts team, uh, Mr. Lemaire, um, and that those email exchanges uh, were basically discussing uh, this matter, i.e. whether uh, revenue should be recognised uh, on uh, launches which had been delayed into a subsequent year. Uh, and in my report, I think I'm, I'm clear in saying that, uh, that those email exchanges uh, don't, for me, in my opinion, represent uh, an attempt to inflate um, the numbers. In fact, they represent to me uh, normal email exchanges between the CFO, the accounts team, and the auditors. And in fact, if you, just in the context of this, because obviously there are conflicting interests, uh, Mr. Lees and Mr. Le Maire and the SCA, and they have their conflicting interests in 2013. The way I would illustrate this for your Lordship is if you took these emails out of the company, nothing to do with Elsco and you parachuted them down into another company where there are no uh, conflicts of interest, and you looked at those in the cold light of day, would you say they represented anything more than just exchanges between auditors and the CFO uh, and the other staff in the normal course of business? And my conclusion is that no, they don't represent anything more than normal exchanges uh, between the parties. Uh, and that is my effort. Can you take out, um, have, keep open that page and then just take out volume A and page 167, which is the order of uh, my Lord. So volume to, A. As to, your, as to the scope of your evidence. Bundle A. Got bundle A, tab 20. I read it out to you earlier on. Tab 20. Tab 20. Which page? 167. Yes. Paragraph 1B is my Lord's order. Par page 167. Paragraph 1B is my Lord's order. Mm -hmm. As to what he wants the experts to opine on. Do you see that? Yes. So, uh, whether, the, whether the approach to revenue recognition proposed by the claim inflated revenue in the draft accounts and whether the approach is consistent with the previous accounting years and international accounting standards. He's not asking you to opine on whether it was appropriate for the CFO to have reviewed and discussed with the auditors. What your opinion, Eric, at 3004J, is outside the scope of your instructions, would you agree? Uh, I think that's for the, the, the court to consider. Uh, because, as I say in the joint statement, uh, is that I read the explanatory note uh, issued by the court in relation to 
the order, uh, which perhaps you can you can indicate to me in the bundle. I that think it's be. very hard to make complete disconnection well, well, um, between what's court requested and what's the expert. It goes some well, it goes beyond, far beyond uh, my knowledge. At the least at this point, it would be very hard. So here I have in in my joint statement on page three zero zero four I. Uh, I've actually uh, set out that paragraph in the explanatory uh, uh, statement of the court. Uh, and it says, having given sufficient consideration to the doc documentary evidence and party submissions, as well as the defendant's amended submission, I found that the question of whether the claimant's conduct in preparing the 2013 accounts was in breach of the SCA in previous years' established practice, or in any event in breach of his duties, is difficult to be answered by the court without expert yes, Mr. Kim, it's all about the claimant's behaviour. Well, so I, I yes, it's all about his behaviour. Well, my mm. lord, th this expert, I'll just, and I'll go and submit, is, uh, is, is trying to give an opinion on a matter that's for the court to decide. It's not a matter for the expert evidence as per the order. Well, I, see. I, no I notice your opinion. Um, and we'll make submissions in due course. But the other point uh, yes. I want to make... I just want to respond to that briefly. Um, the words, whether the... And this is in the order. In your order, Your Lordship. 1B. The expert shall assist the court in understanding whether the approach to revenue recognition proposed. Now, that, in my submission, requires focus on the document where it is said he's proposing an approach. And that's what I said, the claimant's behaviour during the course of dealing. So this witness's uh, testimony and expert reports is within the scope well, of well, no, Nothing wrong to record, Mr. Kim, opinion yes, in this matter. Nothing wrong. I mean, and, 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 and that is your right. Yeah. Yeah. That, that is your right to say your opinion and to be recorded. The court would um, now, I want to take it into account. I want to your that I see it's clearly uh, for the court to decide. But what I'm seeking to do in giving my, my view in the joint statement is to assist the court in, uh, in, 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 uh, in arriving at uh, yeah. that decision. Now, you've seen um, some emails. You've um, opined on the, the duties of the CFO. Other than that, there's no other basis for your opinion at 3004J. Is that right? No other... Um, what, what are the assumptions and facts other than the emails that you've seen and your assumption and your general description of the role of the CFO to inform your opinion? Um, first of all, I would say uh, the first thing is obviously my 25 years of experience in, in these fields. The second is my understanding of uh, the step one, step two uh, uh, approach. Um, and the third thing I would say is that uh, we've illustrated, uh, we've identified and reviewed examples where there must have been that step one, step two approach. Um, otherwise they wouldn't have accounted for revenue in the way they did. Eric, what you're opining on here, let's be specific is whether it was appropriate for the CFO to have reviewed and discussed with the auditors to identify whether there was a difference between cash, cash base and the accruals approach. Your answer to the court earlier was an answer to something different. What is the basis of your opinion in this part of the joint report? What assumptions, other than the emails that you've seen in your general description of the, the juice of the CFO, What other basis is there for your opinion? Oh, you mean basis like is evidence, like yes, evidence. Is that And I'm going to move on to some other types of evidence in a moment, but just to, to give the witness an opportunity, other than emails and his description of what a CFO should do, is there anything else that you took into account? Well, well, where do you think you're going to take step one from, uh, step two from? Well, he's been instructed um, by Mr. Lease, he's told him about that. But this is about whether the CFO should have reviewed and discussed these matters with the auditors. And I just want to ask this expert witness what the basis for that opinion is, because... Oh, you mean the reference? Yes. Yeah. Why is he... Why, what, what is the evidential basis for that opinion, other than the emails and your 
assumed description of a CFO. Yeah. The emails are the emails are are there, and the emails show uh, that one of the key issues in, in the context of the audit is revenue recognition. Uh, and that issue of revenue recognition related to uh, whether revenue should be recognized in one year where the cash should not yet be received. Now, I think that, that's pretty clear from the emails. And it's it's my, my opinion that it's normal for a CFO uh, to discuss CFO, accounts department, other people within the organisation to discuss those issues and particularly with the auditors because you have to give comfort to those auditors. Are you aware? And the second thing I would add is that, as I explained earlier... You know what, he, he is troubled with this. What, how do you think that you're comfortable with the CFO to raise these things through the emails with the company? But you said the reference of that is the email. But yeah. Mr. Kip says... The emails themselves is the action. So what what push you to say it's it's normal, it's nothing wrong with the claimant to do to propose that kind of emails. Yeah. You I understand that? Yeah. My, 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 my Before you reach that email. Okay. Yeah. I understand. Thank you. Yeah. Sure. Uh, and I think the answer to that is twenty five years experience uh, in this field. Well, I've seen this on many, many occasions, any nature of emails passing between the CFO and the auditors and the accounts department and so forth. Um, you know, so that's your expertise? Yes, yes exactly. Elsico is a small company, correct? Uh, give me the definition of a small company. And, 14 uh, employees. I can confirm that there are larger companies than Elsico. 14, it's a 14 employees. It's not a large company, is it? It's not a large company. It's a medium-sized Ooh. company at best. Did you take that into account in, in um, reaching your opinion? Um, I'm, not, I'm not sure that would have a bearing, actually, whether the size of the company no. and the nature of the communications. In fact, I would say uh, the less structured a company is, the smaller, the smaller the company, the less likelihood there is that they would have um, big structures in place, but no, according to his question, you have not taken into account this, the size of the company while you're reaching this conclusion. No, not, not specifically, no. no specifically. Have you taken into account the SCA um, and the payments that were due to be made to Mr. Lease under that agreement and his position as CFO, which is a unique circumstance in this case, in reaching that opinion? You're referring to the conflict of interest. Yes. I think I, I referred earlier that the parties in this case uh, have conflicting interests. I think everybody agrees. Um, that what I seek to do in arriving that opinion is to say, okay, as I said earlier, we take these emails out of the company, parachute them into another company. Uh, would they would they look unusual? So the answer is yes. You take into account yes. the well, balance of. I think parties. it's the, op the opposite, isn't it? That you took into account the emails and you asked yourself what um, another company would have done or what another CFO would have done another company with those emails. But you didn't take into account the conflict of interest under the SCA um, and Mr. Lee's position. Is well, that right? Mr. Kim, I think, and correct me if I'm wrong, when he gave that example, if we take this bunch of emails and put them into other com company, he's trying to give an example Whereas a company where there is no conflict of interest, such like this one in our case, compared to the company, that means you are recognizing there are a conflict of interest between parties in this. Is that right? Exactly. Um, I'm you sorry, I'm just for the matter of time and easing. Uh, I'm, yes. I, I'm not suggesting, but uh, uh, that's what I understood from what he said. I have, I have a few more questions on this subject, um, yeah. and I will be, I'll keep to that, um, my word on that. I'm, I'm, I'm okay. I'm okay. You, you think you're going to one thirty, something like that? Okay. Yes, I just want to ask a few more yes, questions. Yes, take, take take Are you aware of any evidence of the claimant having this debate with auditors about the, whether whether uh, there should be a cash-based or accrual approach in previous years? 
No, I'm not. And, uh, I don't. Uh, I don't. I don't. I don't include that suggestion in my opinion. Everyone's agreed that in this case, the ground rules for revenue recognition were set in 2010. The only, the only exception to that is just going back to your prior Sorry. question. Uh, is the is the uh, the evidence that, as I said earlier, that there are examples of revenue being recognised in one year, where the cash is recognised in a subsequent year. Now, if there hadn't been a review process in place in those previous years, uh, then the likelihood is that that wouldn't have happened. Those items wouldn't have been accounted in that way. So although I confirm I wasn't there, uh, you know, I, w I wasn't able to confirm, and I don't, uh, whether the same interactions happened in 2012, 2011, 2010 and so forth. There is evidence to just suggest in terms of what actually happened on the revenue recognition um, and the, the significance of those elements in terms of proportion of total uh, uh, fixing income commission um, Make suggest it's a leap of faith, but I would I would, I would suggest that um, there would have been discussions of that nature. Right. And are you, that's your supposition rather than any evidence. Well, it's my supposition that it's unlikely that uh, an audit firm would come in, audit the accounts, and not have fully understood why 15% of the revenue uh, had been accounted in one year uh, where the cash had not been received. That's now, my evidence. Th there's evidently a dispute between the parties about the um, approach to revenue recognition. No, I think Mr. Kim wants to get you, the, like your revision or the comparison you should do like 2013 with the last three previous years, 10, 11 and 12 only, and you should not go before that date. Is that what you were trying to say? And is that, that uh, like the yes. right approach of your revision? Well, the the, uh, the Yassat example is in 2010, so I think it's very yeah. pertinent. I'm asking a very specific question to this witness, um, which is about the his opinion um, and his opinion about the debate that was had in 2013 uh, between the CFO and the auditors about the cash-based accounting approach and the accruals approach. And I think he's given his evidence that he's not aware of any evidence that that debate was had between Mr. Leese and the auditors in previous years. Up to 2010. Yes, from 2010 to 13. 13. Now, my next question is the parties. Well, not 2013, but you know, yeah. to be, be precise about it. Uh, have I seen Have I seen evidence that suggests there are interactions between uh, the CFO and the auditors uh, in respect to 2010, 11, and 12? Not specifically apart from uh, the, the examples of, uh, of uh, the choice policies that I've referred to. Yeah, I'm actually not, I'm not asking you about general interactions between the CFO and the auditors. It's a very specific question, and it's about when the debate was had about the difference between a cash-based accounting approach and the accruals approach between Mr. Lease well, he, and the he's, auditors. He said it. I have not seen that debate, but so, I have seen the examples for recognitions. So, exactly. there's a disagreement about the method to revenue, approach to revenue recognition, but everyone's... Mr. Kim, Mr. Kim, because his mission is to compare methodologies, okay? And that is not in the debate, but that in the actual fact sheets. And that's what he's looking, that's what he was looking for. You um, with me? I'm not sure that I'm with you, my lord. Um, you ask him to base his opinion in the debate rather than in the fact. No, that's, I think there's so been... debate is taking us nowhere, exactly as what we're doing in this case now. No, no. Um, we are here because of the debate. No, I'm asking for him to, to, whether in reaching this opinion, he took into account the fact that there weren't these debates. He said they no, have not seen. He, was, he said but, they have not seen. But in light of that, um, that there had been, you had no evidence before you of any previous debates in previous years. W wouldn't your opinion be that Mr. Leese in 2013 should have consulted with management before 
um, reviewing and discussing this debate with the auditors? I think, uh, based on my, well, obviously I wasn't there, and I wasn't in any of the meetings, but my, my opinion is based on the exchange of emails. Um, and in that exchange of emails, uh, many people were on copy of that exchange. The council department, Mr. Le Maire, the auditors, uh, the CFO. Um, what more can I say? What's the difference between auditors and management, Mr. Kemp, in, this, in this context? Ma management being Mr. Le Maire. Um, at all, and or Ms. Um, Tolles. We've seen Mr. Lumiere involving in the and to some extent in the process, isn't it? No, but uh, auditors being PwC because it's appointed why by, by the defendant. But it's uh, the defendant's case that Mr. Lee's put these put this debate to PwC before he consulted Mr. Lumiere or Ms. Tolles. And what I'm trying to put to the expert is bearing in mind there was no evidence this debate had been had in previous years. Don't you think that Ms. it would have been appropriate for Mr. Lees to have had this debate? Oh, my learned friend has just given evidence that the debate didn't occur in the previous years. We don't know whether that's the case or not because we haven't examined any evidence. Well, it's a bit academic, yes, but I would, I would allow it. Okay, that's, I, I think it's, it's a little bit central in this case. Okay, if there has been debate such like this, should be put to management? Easy, see, take, see, take all. All, all, everything, the whole circumstances and account. CFO wants to propose uh, 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 deferred revenues. There is an appointed auditors. There is an accountant working, accounting, accounting team. There is a management. And take into account the size of the company, the relation between parties, maybe everything. Claimant should have suggested this to the management first, to the auditor first. Is there is any rule in this regard at all? There's, there's no, no rule, Your Lordship. I mean, uh, it depends on the, on the kind of structure and the nature of the company. The interaction of, between management and members of, of a management team in a company is different depending on which company you're, you're talking about. <coughs> I could give you examples where uh, the, the CEO of a company wouldn't want to be uh, uh, bothered with details on this. He would be telling the CFO, saying, this is your domain. Uh, if you think it's reasonable to go off and talk to the auditors, you go off and talk to the auditors. Uh, obviously, when it comes to a board meeting, uh, then they may be uh, there, the CFO might uh, be required to give an update on the audit. Would, you still, would, this, that would you still give the same answer if you know there is conflict of interest between the CEO and the CFO? Um, I think if there was if there was conflict, then there, there would be a, a case for uh, the discussions to be to be open. Um, whether they're at the same time as the discussions with the auditors before, afterwards, it makes no difference. At the end of the day, the auditors will make their own independent opinion. That's the whole idea of the audit behind it. Yes, Mr. Kent. So two, two more questions. That um, yes. the, the, the ground rules to revenue recognition were set in 2010, say. So it, for the purposes of the SCA, or the retained earnings figure, based on the 2010, the method it adopted in the 2010 accounts, correct? So I didn't understand the question. Sorry, the ground rules for revenue recognition, I think everyone has agreed, were set in, it, well, were established in 2010. Uh, I can't confirm that. I mean, there's an example uh, in 2007 where the revenue being recognised in one year and the cash had been received in the subsequent year. But so I can't confirm that the ground rules, as but, you refer, but your expert, were established in 2010. Your, but your expert evidence is that um, the practice as to revenue recognition has remained the same since 2010 through to 2013. Correct. My, my evidence is to say that the... And he gave an example in 2010, isn't it? Not, not concerned about the examples, no. but just in terms of my propositions. Evidence, my evidence is actually not to say that they stayed the same between 2010 and 2013, because I think they could change in 2013. But the method, the two-step method, you say, has stayed the same since 2010. That's 
some summary of your position. Are you want to confirm this or are you questioning this? I'm not sure well, what, what you want. Ju- there are some. There's a few building blocks to my question, yeah. uh, my lord. Yeah, that's and right. I, did, I wasn't expecting it to be difficult to establish the basic premise, yeah. which is that, um, which is, I'll just put the question. I think once yes. the ground rules are set as to revenue recognition, would you expect a debate? about cash and accruals to open up again each year between the CFO and the auditors. If the ground rules uh, had been established, um, I wouldn't think there's a need to revisit those ground rules. Uh, I would think there'd be a need to revisit um, the, the policy that might fall in the scope of, of, of the, the step two uh, of that approach. But he, but, um, but, and um, w- given that there had been three years of accounts since 2010, um, shouldn't the CFO know how this revenue is to be treated? two-step approach and that that he would need to review uh, step two uh, uh, at the end of each year. But what's the point of having this debate unless he wanted to change the method of revenue recognition? The point of having the debate with the auditors? I just said that the discussion would be which items, uh, you know, which, uh, which, which, which policies uh, in terms of say we're talking about 2013, 2014, so which policies which have been signed up in 2013 in deferred uh, into future periods, to what extent had the work relating to those policies been carried out in 2013? Uh, because a significant amount of work had been carried out on those policies and there was potential uh, for some of that revenue uh, to be recognized in 2013. Uh, and I understand that that was the, 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 the key to the debate. It's not the ground rules. It's you know, applying these ground rules, which of these policies uh, would, be, uh, would be included or not. Um, my Lord, I've got no further questions, which I think um, brings me up to before the 1.30. Um, Thank you very much. That's fine. No re-examination. Thank you very much, Sir. Thank you. You made the books. Well, so we're in a rush. We still take one hour break for lunch. We'll come back to 13.